podcast listeners, this is What Scares Us, a podcast brought to you by the Ann Arbor District Library, where four friends discuss movies that make us walk quickly past the eyes staring out of the storm drain and make us think differently about a hedge maze or a croquet mallet. I'm Amanda, and I'm joined by three other staff members of the library. And this is Christopher. This is Matt. I'm Allison. All right, so this episode, we are discussing the 2019 movie Dr. Sleep, directed by Mike Flanagan, who you might know from working on The Haunting of Hill House, The Haunting of Bly Manor, Midnight Mass, or The Midnight Club. So the film Dr. Sleep is based on a 2013 book of the same name written by Stephen King. The novel is a direct sequel to King's 1980 or 1977 novel, I think it was 77, The Shining. For this episode... We all watched and are going to be discussing the director's cut version of Dr. Sleep. It adds about 30 minutes to an already long film, but there are some really great extra scenes that I wanted to to talk about today. And just to warn you, starting now, there will be spoilers for the book, movie, and TV versions of both The Shining and Dr. Sleep starting now. So if for some reason you haven't watched The Shining and want to... Probably watch that first. (laughs) Um, Also, who are you? (laughs) So, what is Dr. Sleep about? Dr. Sleep focuses on the character of Danny Torrance, the kid from The Shining. Ewan McGregor portrays him as an adult, and Dan is struggling. His mother is now gone, and it's just him, his past demons, a violent streak, and several bottles of alcohol. Sounds familiar. As a grown man, Dan still has the shine, which is the ability to communicate telepathically with others and gives people the ability to see things that have happened in the past or will happen in the future. Through his mind, he meets a young girl named Abra, who is in trouble when a group called the True Knot sets out to come find her. This vampire-esque group feeds off children with the shine, and Abra has it really strong, so they want her. So at large, it's a battle between good and evil, It takes us back to the Overlook Hotel, which was the setting for the terrible things to happen to a very young Dan and his family. At the core, The Shining is about addiction, and Dr. Sleep is about recovery. So before we get to discussing the film and all of this at large, I want to mention a couple of fun facts. There are, like, so many we could talk about, but I just picked a couple. Um, So The Shining... Adaptation from 1980 was directed by Stanley Kubrick, and it is very well known that Stephen King did not like the film. And one of the main reasons was how Jack Torrance was portrayed in the film, even though he did a great job, the actor. um, In the book, Jack is struggling mentally and is trying to be a family man. He's a recovering alcoholic, and you could empathize him with as a character. And then the hotel starts to have an effect on him and he loses his mind. Whereas in the movie, he kind of starts out as a psychopath and the hotel just makes it worse. Mm -hmm. So there's no arc to his character. So that was one of the things that King um, hated about it. Um, King also struggled with addiction himself. And The Shining was such a personal story. And he just did not like what Kubrick did to his book. So later, he connected with director Mick Garris, and they created a 1997 TV series of The Shining that was more true to the book. Matt is shaking his head. I actually like that one. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So if you are making a film adaptation of the sequel to The Shining, in which most people, even if they haven't seen it, whoever they are, you have those visuals seared in your brain of what the hotel is, of Danny and the tricycle. It's seared into your brain. So if you're making a sequel, what sequel do you make? One for Kubrick's movie or one for King's book? Well, in this case, both. It ends up being a hybrid of the two Shinings. So director Mike Flanagan, he is a self-proclaimed, like he's a huge Stephen King fan, huge. He also adapted Gerald's Game, which was great. And apparently he's trying to work on the Dark Tower adaptation. Good Um, luck. Yeah, mixed mixed (laughs) thoughts about that. Um, uh, So for Dr. Sleep, he wanted to make sure he had Stephen King's blessing. That was really, really, really important to him. He wouldn't have done it if he did not have um, Steve's blessing. So he did. He got he, and he sent he talked to Steve and he actually got permission to meld Dr. Sleep book with Kubrick's film version of The Shining. Um, so he puts together the visuals from the the Kubrick's The Shining and then the storytelling of Dr. Sleep. And he actually brings back the real ending that was in the book The Shining, which was also really important. Total fun stuff. Oh my gosh, super exciting. Like think about that. <laughs> um, too excited. Um, so the overlook for this, the movie was recreated to look like it did in the 1980 film, which is really cool. They used blueprints that they got from the Kubrick estate. 
Um, the movie Doctor Sleep did not do well at the box office at all. It was a flop. It was a flop, but it has found its audience via VOD and streaming, which is great. Um, so I could talk about Mike Flanagan and Stephen King for even more than I just did. And there are a lot of other fun facts and throwbacks we could throw in there. Um, but we will get more into that as we discuss things. Um, before we go on, though, to talk about things more in detail, I want to hear about y'all's relationship to Dr. Sleep. Well, I love Kubrick's Shining, The Shining. I think it's a fantastic movie right from the very first scene on. Uh, I have not read much Stephen King, only one book, Salem's Lot. Mm, never read The one. Shining, never read Dr. Sleep. I watched the director's cut of this twice. I love this movie. I thought it was fantastic visually, the casting, the pace, and the really interesting way that the plot unfolds I thought was so different and it I thought it was even different from Mike Flanagan's other movies that I've seen hmm. I have a really kind of twisty relationship with with this overall story so the first horror movie I ever saw at age seven was The Shining wow um, that was some irresponsible parenting <laughs> on, Good my, job. on my dad's behalf um, it fully destroyed me and and made my uh <laughs> <laughs> my threshold for scary things like like unbelievably high or low anyway uh i love the shining i think it might be my favorite horror movie it still works for me um i didn't read the shining until actually last summer but i read doctor sleep in 2019 so again it's like i'm pretty married to Kubrick's Shining, and I understand now, mm -hmm. I, having read the book and seen the miniseries, the uh, I understand his his gripes with the Kubrick movie. But to me, it's like it's perfect, mm -hmm. and some mm -hmm. of the stuff that he kind of, you know, threw out to make the movie work uh, works really well for me. Uh, Doctor Sleep. When I saw it initially, I saw the theatrical version. I did not like it. Um, it felt very much like a remember the shining mm -hmm. to me. Um, and revisiting it for th this and watching the director's cut, I liked it so much more. Um, more of the things that I liked about the book, Dr. Sleep, which is just an okay Stephen King book, in my opinion. Um, more of what worked in that was put back in the movie. But then also, like you had mentioned, there were pieces from The Shining that were kind of added back mm -hmm. in flashbacks and stuff that probably satisfied Stephen King and satisfied some of the people that prefer the book to the... Anyway, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's my relationship with it. Twisty and messy. Nice. Um, Matt also has read a vast uh, collection of Stephen King books. Tons. I, I've... I, yeah, that's true. Recently, I've... I have kind of gotten really hooked on just collecting them. Mm -hmm. um, I now am up to, I think I have 52 of his titles. Wow. I've read, uh, I have a checklist somewhere. I've read <laughs> like almost 30 of them in the last, just in the last couple of years. Um, you know, I read a couple of his books when I was younger. I think my first Stephen King book was actually The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, which was like, I was probably in early high school when I read that. Um, but I loved it. And then I weirdly read Hearts in Atlantis. And then I read <laughs> uh, It. But that was years and years ago, and I definitely didn't absorb it right. Um, yeah. Anyway, I love Stephen King stuff, so this movie kind of, like, scratched a lot of itches for me. While mm -hmm. I, But also, I still have a, some gripes about it, but we'll get into that. I also have read a lot of Stephen King, but um, mostly in middle school. So I have, like, a fine layer of dust over all my... <laughs> sort of memories of reading these books. Um, but I've read The Shining. I really love the book. The movie is all right to me. I really like the visuals, like the aesthetic quality of Kubrick's um, adaptation. But the act of watching the movie is like somewhat boring to me. Um, and I think I might have started Dr. Sleep. But I don't think I finished it. There were some things that were like... Uh, I had like a weird sense of deja vu watching this the first time. I watched the theatrical for the first time in September and also did not enjoy it. Um, <laughs> watched 
the director's cut this time around, I also watched it twice like Christopher and thought the director's cut was so much better. Although I still don't uh, really like this movie (laughs) for reasons we'll talk about. But um, I did have a really good time watching it and sort of figuring out like, well, okay, what doesn't work about this for me? Or Mm -hmm. um, spending a lot of time comparing the movie with what I knew about the Dr. Sleep book with what I knew about The Shining book with what I knew about The Shining movie. I haven't seen the um, Mick Garris version. But Mm -hmm. anyway, I had a really great time thinking about this um, and prepping for this episode, although I don't really enjoy this uh, movie that much. And I do like some Mike Flanagan stuff. Particularly Oculus is one of the few movies that actually legitimately <laughs> scares me. Um, and I recently watched Absentia, which I really liked as well, especially for a first movie. So, Oculus is so great. It scared the shit out of me when I first watched it. <laughs> never even heard of it. Oh, really? Oh, you yeah. should watch it. it well. It's good. Huh. I also think that his um, Ouija Origin of Evil movie is mm-hmm. so good, especially compared to the absolute dog shit first movie. <laughs> Yeah, I like Luigi. Um, Hush is also great. Huh. Ah, that movie is good. Hush, yeah. Yeah, I've only seen Gerald's game uh, of his, and my wife was watching Midnight Mass in 2021 like everybody else was, mm. and um, but I didn't see any of that, so. Yeah, so when Dr. Sleep came out, um, well, I first, I first watched The Shining in the late 80s. I was in eighth grade. My best friend was over. We were having a sleepover, and we were watching it, and we were just, like, terrified. And when the bathtub lady was crawling out, we were just, like, closing our eyes and screaming because also <laughs> she was naked. And we were just like, oh, my God. Um, so that was, like, in eighth grade. And then I was going to read the book shortly after, and I started it and did not because I, it was a whopper, and I just did not. But then I ended up reading – um, it like a, for the, a year later that was my first Stephen King novel was reading it when I was like 14 I was like okay guess we're watching this but that was right before the miniseries came out so I was kind of it tied into that um, and then I didn't read The Shining as a whole book until last year oh. I actually listened to it on audio and it was really good but I'd already seen and I adore like I love Kubrick's version that's just for me it's a perfect hor- it's a perfect film and Agreed. it's a great horror film um, even though I knew Stephen King hated it, you know, but it's one of those works where you've got to look at the source and the adaptation as two separate entities. Mm -hmm. And I am a big fan of Mike Flanagan. I'm a big fan of Stephen King. So I think part of it, my sort of fandom for this whole world kind of softened up, like how I was feeling about an adaptation. I didn't read Dr. Sleep until I knew the movie version was coming out. So I read it, I think the same year you did, Matt. So I Mm -hmm. read it like that summer. And then it was okay. It was an okay book. And I saw it the movie in the theater and I really liked it. I was excited to geek out and see the overlook on the screen. I was just laughing it up with a spoon. Um, It wasn't perfect, but I really enjoyed it. I liked it more than I thought. And I liked it more than I liked the book. I don't know what about it. I was just, I was sort of like, okay, I actually like that. What? And it's funny because when I, other people mentioned Dr. Sleep, one of the first things they say is, oh, I liked it way more than I thought I would. (laughs) So I just think that's so funny that like at least five or six people have, I've heard that them say that and it wasn't prompted. Um, I think people have such strong feelings tied up in The Shining, whether it's the book or the Kubrick mm -hmm. movie or that, like the idea of a sequel. I remember when they announced that there was going to be a sequel to it, the book, I thought that that was the stupidest idea in the world. Yeah. Um, and and what I approached this movie the first time with a pretty bad attitude and then was pleasantly surprised by some of it. But, you know, it's it's an acceptable sequel mm-hmm. and they do. There's definitely some cool stuff there. Uh, yeah. But I can understand a lot of people's resistance to it and also being surprised by, oh, mm-hmm. it was actually wasn't a piece of shit. <laughs> well, it has sleep in the title. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> so it's not called Doctor Exciting or Doctor Spooky. <laughs> right. <laughs> Doctor Spooky. Yeah, that'd be a good nickname. Well part of it too is like the sequel to like the novel The Shining came out a long time ago and for Stephen King to put out the sequel, that was part of like his own journey of addiction and recovery. Mm-hmm. And so I also think of like I don't look at it through that lens, but I see what he you know, and so I can see the importance. So I try to also think about those things and the important steps. Um involved in that kind of thing. And I was, I was, ner- after I read the book, I was, I'm always nervous when they're going to adapt something, like a book that I like or have read. Um, and I'm, I'll watch 
I started my whole, you know, quote unquote Stephen King project just watching these all these adaptations. And I was like, wait a minute, I want to actually read a bunch of these books. So I had to like pause and I started reading more. Um, but part of it is you're just and you're in that world and you get used to the characters and it's a universe. It's the, you're mm-hmm. in the Stephen King universe of all these overlapping characters and um, locations. Yeah. So I was nervous about Dr. Sleep and then knowing like how much Stephen King hated it. But I also knew like that. Flanagan had done such a good job adapting Gerald's game. And I really liked what he did at Hill House. His other stuff, other TV shows weren't out at that at that point. Now he's done a bunch of other stuff. Um, and some people like his newer stuff and some people don't. But he did a good job with those two. And so I had faith that it would it would work out. And I did not have a problem. I was glad the movie. And I I was sad that it bombed. I was I wanted more people to see it. Like I know people who love the book and just won't touch any of this. And I'm like, but 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 um but you know what? You've got to make your own choices. You never know. I read a lot of bad reviews of this movie. Yeah. People didn't like it. Just like read all, the, listen to all the Mike Flanagan interviews. <laughs> That's what, yeah. I was shocked by how much better the director's cut was over the theatrical. Like, oh yeah, like like two full letter grades better. It's yeah. it's it's pretty wild. It's especially weird because I feel like so much of what was added was like transitional shots or like, mm-hmm. oh, here's a couple extra frames of violet, like. Yeah, it's so so many s- extremely small pieces added, but um, I thought it flowed so much better, and it was just more interesting to me in general. Mm-hmm. I've seen the director's cut more. I don't think I've seen the theatrical since the theater. So when I see this movie, it's the it's the director's cut. That's my relationship with aliens. Yeah, that's like what I know. And I know there's, I personally don't have a list of everything that's different. I know that they exist on the internet. Maybe y'all are going to offer that, but for me, that's not. I don't want to, you know, it just is what it is. They're not super interesting to read through. So, yeah. And also, like, I don't, I don't know. There's enough, there's enough information and fun involved in, like, the whole world that we're exploring today. Like, there's a lot. Like, I would not sit on a horror pass and be like, hey, let's watch The Shining. You know what I mean? Because it's just hard. Mm-hmm. And I actually was hesitant to, to pick this film to discuss for today. And I was like, no, we can do it. No, it gives you a ton of stuff oh. to cover. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited. Um <laughs> All right, are we ready to dive into this movie, this three-hour-long movie? All right, so the director's cut is divided into these chapters. We've got a bit of an intro before we get into some of the chapters, and it opens in Florida, 1980. There's a mobile campground and a young girl named Violet who ends up being killed by Rose the Hat and a group of people called the True Knot. Violet and Rose the Hat discuss magic, which is how they are describing being special or having the shine. So it's a very short little thing. And then it cuts to the Overlook Hotel and the rug, which will lead us into our next chapter. Um, so this scene, this was actually not in the book. I'm not going to go th- this, but in this one I know it's so short. It's not in the book, but it kind of mm-hmm. sets up. And I was listening to an interview with Mike Flanagan where he mentioned that he wanted to add this to the beginning because it, it gives you immediately the thing you're supposed to be afraid of or the, the looming thing that's throughout the movie. So I thought that was a cool, a cool ad. Mm-hmm. It is. There's something about the name Rose the Hat that reads well, <laughs> and when it's said out loud, it makes me laugh. Yeah. Um, same thing with the True Knot. <laughs> like it, I remember thinking it was a pretty good thing in the book, um, but yeah, hearing those people say that out loud makes me laugh. But how, how many times have we seen these short intro bits to a horror movie to introduce the the spooky thing mm-hmm, in the movie? Mm-hmm. So we've seen that so many times. But yet I was still startled in this one when the figures are moving closer. Mm -hmm. It's also broad daylight. You know, she's such this uh, this alluring character, soft spoken, nice to children. Mm -hmm. And I I thought it was such a great opening. That was me, though. Also, the, the very first shot, that aerial scene as the, the camera is panning down, 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 or lowering down, mm-hmm. down, down into the, the trailer park. Yeah. To me, that was, one could read that as a kind of um, a reflection of The Shining. Oh, yes, Kubrick, you know, There's tons of that yeah. in this. <laughs> like all the slow crossfades. It's just like, yep. it, that's what I mean by it. Remember The Shining is <laughs> right. like the subtitle for this movie. Yeah. In a good way. <laughs> right. I mean, in a good way. <laughs> And the score, too. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. The end. <laughs> that opening shot, the aerial shot, is one of the, like, that first scene is the first change from the director's cut to the theatrical cut. It's oh, a yeah. totally different yeah. opening in the theatrical. Um, this scene uh, was a little too close to the opening of It for me. 
where I couldn't um, like pull them apart as separate because it's right. like the big Didn't bad and a child yes. and like, oh, come a little closer. But I will say that the true not appearing in the woods was um, like the most scared I was of them. I think it's a super effective shot when they yes. just show up and mm -hmm. then like you keep flashing back and they're a little bit closer, a little yes. bit closer. Yep. I don't find them um, that not scary. I don't find them intimidating at all um but that shot had me kind of wondering like well what is the deal with these people mm -hmm. like what's going on here yeah. yeah and i liked how the shots of more of them appearing as you know first there's just one there's just crow daddy or whoever and then they keep adding them and then yeah i liked i think yeah rose the hat she's a when in the book she's not my favorite character the true not stuff is like my least favorite part of the book the way it's written um but i like the way they did it for this movie and I think Rosa Hatch she's alluring she's beautiful mm -hmm. and she has this seductiveness about her but she's also going to kill this five-year-old girl in, in a second and I just think there's something like really it's fun I really liked it yeah and, that, and that's the that little girl she was in Haunting of Hell House yeah so Mike Flanagan likes to use some of his All actors. The same and actors. Yeah, yes. he has wives and everything too. I don't mind it though. I am the worst because I just will eat it all up and be so excited. And Allison's like, what? And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. In general, I like that when like, a director uses the same actors. But in this in particular, I found it distracting because almost every single actor is in something else. Mm. Like Jacob Tremblay comes out, the baseball boy, and it's like, oh, Remember how bad Before I Wake was? <laughs> um, yeah. This also reminded me of Frankenstein, like the classic oh, scene by the river the flower, and the flowers. Right. Um, and so I was a little disappointed she didn't drown her. <laughs> I really wanted her to. <laughs> huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the most re I was listening to an interview with Mike Flanagan, and he mentioned the, the Frankenstein comparison. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't even know any. I didn't even. Can even tell you, with last time I watched that movie. I watched it um, last Halloween. Cool. I watched all the Universal like classic. I'm glad you got that. That's a plan, Allison. Awesome. Yeah, it was fun. All right, so are you all ready to head to that the, this this hotel in Colorado or God something? This this hotel. I don't know what the big deal is about it. Um, so that's a very brief scene we start out with, and then we head to Chapter One: Old Ghosts. At the Overlook Hotel, young Danny is riding on his trike on the iconic carpet down the halls, and he stops at room 237. The door opens. Mrs. Matthew, Mrs. Massey, the bathtub lady, comes out, and it cuts to Danny being in Florida with his mother, and it was a nightmare he was having. We see that Danny and his mother are struggling after having left Colorado and the death of Jack. We see Danny sitting by the water, and the ghost of Dick Halloran sits on a bench, and they talk about the shining and mention that for some, the shining is like food. So this is where Danny's learning more about that. Um, Halloran explains to Danny how to lock the ghosts from the overlook in a box inside of his head so they won't bother him anymore. And that comes into play a lot later. And then we see a missing child poster for the young cutie pie Violet. Uh, and then we see Danny lock up Mrs. Massey, the bathtub lady, in a box inside of his mind. So it's another little brief chapter that gives us lots of information to set up the rest of the movie. Really good casting. I was just going to say that. Um, like I, was, I, I wasn't sure what to expect with recasting some of these very iconic roles, and they did a really great job with all of them. Mm -hmm. So I thought the, the woman who portrayed Wendy looked and sounded. Mm -hmm. there, there are so many times when she's speaking, she sounds just like it's Shelley Duvall in The Shining. Yeah. Right? It's unnerving. Yeah. 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 Her voice, she does these little high trails of Danny. Danny. Yeah. It's, Danny. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. And, and instead of being jarring or annoying, I just thought it was great. Mm -hmm. yeah. I really liked it. Um, Mike Flanagan talks about this and some of the behind the scenes stuff, how they were sort of like damned if they do, damned if they don't, where people have like mm -hmm. such an attachment to um, the uh, original cast members as these characters and so they could go the route of like star wars and digitally recreate their faces mm -hmm. which is always terrible i think it's never been good so uncanny and just like weird never works really strange mm -hmm. to watch you hear that hollywood aadl is calling that's right <laughs> i 
uh, was distracted by these um, recasts at the beginning and didn't always feel... I, I was distracted by it, but the one person I do think that they nailed is um, Henry Thomas as Jack later. Wild. It turns out if you just shave half that man's head off, like <laughs> hair off, he's Jack Nicholson. Mm-hmm. I didn't flesh. realize until this viewing that that was Elliot from E.T. Oh, really? He's had... in all of Mike Flanagan's Yeah, he's stuff. in everything. Oh, okay. And he's awesome. He's a great, yeah, he's great. actor. Yeah. And that... I mean, of all the roles to nail, um, I think Jack would is it's got to be the hardest one because Jack Nicholson mm-hmm. is so specific. Well, mm-hmm. because Jack Torrance is Jack Nicholson, yeah. like yeah. the man himself. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And when I guess when or maybe this was in the extras, like when he was going to ask um, his good friend Henry Thomas to, I need you to play Jack Torrance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And he's like, but let me tell you where we're going to do your hairline. And he's like, no, I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> so I can't imagine um, the pressure. Yeah. No. It was really cool. I mean, well, I mean, we won't get to meet or see him till later. Way but later. it's very, it was really, it's cool casting. And the way they shot it was really cool, too, and effective. Um, but the, I didn't have any emotion towards, like, the, the child, the actor, the child actor who plays Danny. Like, that didn't, the hair was good and the tricycle and everything. He had the same feel. Mm-hmm. Um, I was still picturing the real the young Danny from The Shining's face in yeah. it. Um, what's interesting, when I was reading or listening to the audiobook for The Shining last year, um, it was different listening to the audiobook. That was my first like full read of The Shining. Mm-hmm. And when I was listening to it and picturing the visuals in my head, and sometimes I would picture the visuals in the actors that were in Kubrick's The Shining, and sometimes I was picturing the actors that were in Mick Garris's 97 TV version. So... And I was kind of, I kind of surprised myself that I was doing that. I kind of danced around different scenes that were different people. Huh. Um, what's his name? Steve Weber, whoever played, he plays Jack. Dude the from more, Wings. The more, yeah, the Wings guy <laughs> yeah. played the more believable Jack Torrance, the book version, and the TV version. It was just trippy. And then I don't really, I didn't really picture Shelley Duvall a lot. I saw the other, the Re- Rebecca Dormornay. It was really interesting. Mm. It was really trippy. Um, to have all of these like visuals in my. Head. I had a very similar experience <laughs> when I read the book. I was t- kind of darting back and forth between the things. But. Yeah, it's, it was just an interesting way to digest the, the yeah. material. Um, all right, so we got some good intro here. Now the next chapter is chapter two, and it's kind of a longer chapter. Um, this one, chapter two is called Empty Devils, and it is New Jersey in 2011, and it cuts to a grown Dan Torrance in bed, and we see him remembering a wild night the night before with booze, drugs, and sex with probably a woman he met at the bar, Dick Halloran appears towards the end of the scene and tells him that you can't put memories in a box, that real ghosts, you take them with you. Because um, as a grown Dan, he's gotten very used to putting all of his bad memories in these, bo- or the bad, the ghosts that are coming back to haunt him in these boxes in his head. Um, then we cut to a movie theater. There's a young teenage girl who we learn is Andy. She's on a date with an older man. We also see Rose the Hat and a man, Crow Daddy. He's her second in command. Sitting Rose behind them, we later find out that Andy has the shine. Rose and Crow Daddy kidnap Andy and take her back to the campground. Later, we see a conversation with Andy and Rose, and Rose tells Andy she wants to turn her. And then it will be springtime forever. Eat well, stay young, live long. We hear that a lot from Rose the Hat. Um, We later see the process on a beach where Andy is turned, and she then joins the true knot, which involves her eating the steam of the young girl named Violet. So kids have this strong steam. Gives them long life. Um, so sadly, Dan wakes up under a bridge. He's wasted. He has hit his bottom. He heads to the bus stop, throws down a few bucks, and takes the bus to a random city, Fraser, New Hampshire. He's in a small town and sees a replica model called Teeny Town. There he meets a man named Billy who sees Dan needs help. He sees he sets Dan up with an apartment, a job at Teeny Town, gets him into AA, and Dan lands a job at a hospice called Rivington House as an orderly. Well, at the hospice, we see a cat named Azzy. Meow. <laughs> um, Azzy visits a sick man, and Dan goes in the room, and he is called Doc by the patient. The cat seems to know when someone is going to die and then goes to the room of that person. So this is the first instance of Dan using the shine to talk and comfort somebody through as they are dying and it's the first time he is called dr sleep which people end up calling him that and as he continues to work at this at this facility um when he gets home from work there's a message on this 
painted blackboard in his apartment that says, hello, with a smiley face, Dan writes back, hi. And this becomes the beginning of Dan and the young, a young girl named Abra talking telepathically. The chapter closes on a shot of the snowy Overlook Hotel. The music is playing, and we go to the bar in the Gold Room, and it ends before we get to the next chapter. So, Dan, he's not doing great. <laughs> no, yeah, he's not. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but he looks great. He's the best-looking, messy alcoholic I've ever seen oh, because yeah. it's Ewan McGregor. <laughs> yeah, it's, tra- it's Train's body. <laughs> yeah. Aww. So the one part I wasn't quite clear on, is the woman dead then or she dies later? Is I th- she? I think she dies later because I was... Seems like it. You can see her breathing a little bit. Maybe the lady that acting. he picks up at the bar. Who is also one of Steve Harrington's mean friends in season one of Stranger <gasps> Things. I did not know that. The mm-hmm. What? That's the redhead? Yeah. Stop. Yep. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. Oh, look, at the King Universe has got a little <laughs> bigger of a dent in my heart. <laughs> oh, love it. Yeah, that scene, uh, like, conceptually is one of the scariest to me in this entire movie. But it also had the sort of unwanted effect of making it hard for me to identify and root for Dan. Like, I understand he's sort of at his worst, but I can't imagine a scenario where I would leave a baby in that scenario. It made it hard for me to root for him until later in the movie. Mm -hmm. Sure. I've done that, though. You left a baby? <laughs> Astrid, we've You left a lady questions. in her puke and there was a baby and That's you were right. taking the money. Walked. Yeah. Got yeah. the nearest yeah. bus. Yeah. And I like how... So I could relate. Because well, Dick, sure. Dick Halloran shows up and then part of Danny's like excuse is like, well, she took my money for the drugs. Mm-hmm. Like there's all this cocaine sitting all over the place. This, the bit with the mom and the baby, that is a flashback and something that haunts Danny a lot in the book. In the book, it really comes back a lot. So this scene... It, it pains him. It's like a really, really, you can't, this is the thing, this is a memory. You can't put this in a box. You take this ghost with you. Mm-hmm. And so knowing how horrible he was in this scene or how, how terrible of a person he was and what he did, he takes, this is part of the his his shove and his the impetus for like getting help and staying because that baby, assuming that, you know, it haunts him. I also think I read online <clears throat> that it happens differently in the book and that like, both of them do die, but not directly as a result of Dan's inaction. I don't. I can't remember. The, the movie in the movie, it didn't seem like it died of. I don't think they died in the movie of Dan's direct his inaction in that moment. I think it was just he didn't. Really? Yeah, I don't think they died in that moment. In the way I perceived it, he didn't. Maybe this is my warped version of reading the book and knowing that. I don't know. It also doesn't matter. My assumption was that she like OD'd on the bed and then the baby was just like stuck there and starved to death. But I haven't read the book, so he did give the baby a few Cheez Its though. Yeah. That that might, that's probably like enough. Six, eight months. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. I mean it's a hard <laughs> scene. Love Cheez-Its. <laughs> it's a hard scene. Um I love Cheez Its. <laughs> it helps it helps reinforce like how awful Dan is and how far he's yeah. like if you look at his father going through alcoholism and his, you know, mental illness, this is he's Jack's son. And so to see him, it's like, okay, he's not murdering his family yet, but y- you know, so it, it just kind of shows that okay, there's gotta be some redeeming qualities coming out of Dan soon. Right. It is interesting, though, because, um, like, even though they have sort of similar arcs, like, uh, when I think Jack Torrance, I think, like, anger Mm -hmm. and taking that out on his family, whereas I don't really get that vibe from Danny. It's more of, like, inaction or, like, not Mm -hmm. stepping up or... Like, uh, like a numbing sort of. Um, there is that bar scene. I was gonna say they kind the of hamfistedly t- toss that the anger thing in there, like uh, when he's hitting the guy with the, the pool 13 ball. Thirteen pool ball. Yeah, because <laughs> he yells out, "Take your medicine." <laughs> yeah, and that's a throwback to oh. right. Mm. So that's the, that. the anger. Yeah, he's right. pummeling the guy, and then there's a part of the the film. I don't know if he says it or Dick says it or. Oh, no, when he is making out with the woman, she's like, "I don't know, maybe you killed him. I don't know. Kiss me, like." <laughs> Because he doesn't, they don't know if he actually like he yeah. pounds the guy. Take your medicine. He pounds him, pounds him, and he could. The man could have died. He definitely yeah. fucking changed that mm-hmm. guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
So that's where the anger comes from because yeah. he gets that anger. And then later on in the movie too, we talk, he talks a little bit about his anger, mm-hmm. getting that from his father. I also think it ties into later because towards the end, um, uh, Halloran says something along the lines of like, I think you grew up fine, but you still have a debt to pay. And I took that to mean like he was indirectly responsible for that kid dying. And now mm-hmm. he has to save Abra as like a mm-hmm. redemption that makes sense. thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A couple of notes I made was that, so we have another cat. We like to have movies with cats in this podcast, not on purpose, because we're dog people. Team, <laughs> team Marmaduke. Yes. Well, some people like cats. Cats are awesome. I this love is, cats so much. This is a particularly good cat. Um, so this cat's name is Azzy, which is short for Azriel, and Azriel is the angel of death. Oh. And we and the, also the cat is white. I don't know. I thought that was, I, I didn't know about that until I read it online. I thought that was cool. It's modeled off a uh, quote unquote real cat named Oscar who um, was like thought to do a similar thing at a hospice. It, That's he'd, cool. like curl up by whoever was next to leave, <laughs> next to check out. <laughs> There's also, so when he meets this really, this nice guy, a Billy who ends up being his mentor and gets him Love an AA. Billy. Billy's such a good character. Um, I like and that actor. Billy a lot. mentions how he gets these feelings sometimes. So it kind of, talks a little bit more it, you think more about like the shine and how some people can have it really subtle and some people can have it like as, as deep as like Dan or Abra so I like knowing that Billy just immediately trusted Dan and he's in this like really cool apartment and yeah no shit right, what yeah. a cool fucking yeah. apartment yeah. that apartment is kind of what I envision the apartment in Salem's Lot to look like oh. mm, interesting but yeah all right, so end of this chapter, it Be- ended. Oh, sir, sorry, Christopher. Before we leave this chapter, I have to point out my favorite line in the whole movie, Please. maybe. The world is one big hospice with fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> that is really good. What? Yeah. Chapter three, Little Spy. So this opens, we're back, we, in the end of chapter two, we got kind of went to the overlook into the gold room and then it ends. So chapter three begins. There's a nice little fade there, as Nat was referencing. So chapter three. Not little. <laughs> little spy. <laughs> um, it, so it opens at the bar in the Overlook. There's a glass of whiskey on the bar. And the glass of whiskey fades to Dan's sobriety chip that is in his hand. It is eight years later, which is present day. Dan, he is clean shaven. He looks a lot better. He is sober. And he is standing up in front of the group. And he talks about his dad and how he got this anger and his alcoholism from him. We see that Dan is helping people still at the hospice before they die. He's full doctor sleep now. And we see that he is now still writing to that young girl who is now a teenager on the blackboard in his wall in his room at his apartment. At the campground, Crow Daddy talks to Rose. They're all hungry and they're looking for more steam. They need a kid to catch who really shines because the stronger the shine, the more steam they get, which is their food that makes them live longer. Um, so that takes us to Adair, Iowa where we see members of, two members of the True Knot in the audience of a kid's baseball game. And number 19 shines, and they want him. They kidnap him, take him back to the campground, and kill him for his steam in a wonderfully brutal scene. Um, back in her own bread, Abra is seeing what is happening to the baseball boy, and she is screaming. And she mentally, mentally connects with Rose the Hat for the first time during the killing of the boy. Dan connects with Abra and is thrown out of his own bed, landing on the floor in his apartment. He looks in the mirror and sees the word red rum written. He turns around and sees the word murder written on the wall of his apartment because Abra had wrote it there. Um, So Dan writes back on the wall who it is, and she writes baseball boy. The true knot buries the kid, moves on, and then back at school, Abra does some research, and she finds out the name of the baseball boy. In her mind, she learns more about his abduction, and she finds out where he is. Soon after, Abra gets back inside Rose the Hat's head, and Rose is in a grocery store. She's walking around. Rose senses the girl, and she gets her out of her head, and she soon knows where Abra is. And Rose is pissed because this girl is strong, and she hasn't been up against anybody as strong as her. Um, She's astounded by how powerful she is, and she's so steamy, and she's such a good rival for Rose. Uh, far away, Dan senses what's going on, and he's in his with his AA group, and he collapses. And apparently he says, please help me, Tony. And that takes us before our next <laughs> chapter. So, <laughs> woo, lots going on. Obsessed with Tiny Abra. 
just one of the most beautiful little children in the world. <laughs> and I am obsessed with Abra's house. That yes! is the coolest <laughs> fucking house I've ever seen. Typical Mike Flanagan like house porn. All of yeah. the houses in his movies are like <laughs> unbelievable. It's absurd. That I just want that front door if nothing else. <laughs> well, you know what? I totally have that in my recap, but I did not say it out loud. Sorry. Right. Yeah, so chapter two, yeah, there was a birthday party. And there's a magician there. And so she, uh, th- that was one of the first times we hear ever calling it magic. She can do magic mm, like right, the magician. Right. And that's when we know that Abra shines. All Sorry, I spoons. totally left that out of my thing. I was obsessed with Abra's dad's glasses yeah. that did not change in eight years. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. He knows yeah. what he Lucky likes. guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I had the same pair for seven years. So. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, it's also neat, too. Her name is Abra. And there's like Abra Kadabra. Yeah. It's kind of a little cute magic. I was freaking out during this because um, I recognized the actor who plays the magician. He is in The Endless by Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson, a movie that I am obsessed with. Hmm. And he does a magic trick in that movie, oh which goodness. is like one of the coolest scenes of that movie. Because in addition to being being an actor, he is also a magician. I was going to say, is he a magician at, for kids' birthday parties? <laughs> wow. Great. That's he, cool. He's typecast. Yeah, his name's Shane Brady, oh, and he's cool. in a bunch of um, Aaron and Justin's movies. But... Do we know what his stage name is? No. <laughs> and then the guy that plays um, Crow Daddy, which, side note, absolutely hate that name. But <laughs> it's very the stupid. The guy who plays him, Zon McLarnon. Mm-hmm. Um, is also in Resolution, which is the prequel to The Endless. So oh. those two universes were like, uh, there's some weird synchronicity there. That's cool. The actor who played Crow Daddy, he was also in Reservation Dogs. Yeah. Right. He plays Big, which was cool. He's also in um, Westworld or something? Yeah. 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 And yeah. The, yes, credit. another so. member of the True Knot, um, Grandpa Flick, the, the tall man. Yeah. He was the, he's the giant from Twin Peaks. Yep. So I always love it when he's in the stuff. Yep. He's yep. so also commanding. the tall guy in um, Gerald's Game, right? Gerald's Game, mm-hmm. yeah. This is what I'm talking about when like yeah. I got so distracted by like, oh, this guy is from this Mike Flanagan thing. This guy is from this thing. Uh, Robert Longstreet, who's um, the bigger True Not member, he's in like all of Mike Flanagan's recent TV shows. Um, yeah, the baseball kid is was the star of one of his previous movies. Like, just too much. I only, I only knew him from uh, Room. Oh yeah, he's incredible in that too. Explosively sad he's, movie. Yeah, he's yeah. one of those kid actors who's hot and then is in a bunch of stuff. Yeah, but for this, I can see Allison your point because the overlap. There's a lot of. But I don't have a problem with the, the Flanagan overlap. Oh, but. and Katie Parker, who's also one of the True Not, she's in Haunting a Fly Manor. Manor. And then she also was the star of his first movie, Absentia, with a oh, lady he that. also had a child with. <laughs> Oops. Good times. Yes. It's kind Good of times. his thing. I was a little surprised his uh, current wife wasn't in this movie because she's in all of his other work. <laughs> I would have I would have not liked it if she was Rose the Hat. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I could have seen her playing that. Although I do um, like that actress. but um, Kate Siegel? Mm-hmm. Oh, I love her. I just I love them as like a little horror power couple. They're, yeah. So <laughs> I just wanted to say the, the AA speech I thought was one place that I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, maybe I'm a little bit simple, but I'm... <laughs> I'm You're I'm, not? <laughs> I'm starting to watch the speech, and I'm thinking, okay, where is this going to go? We've seen these inspirational feel-good speeches in every single movie that we've ever yeah. seen. And I still didn't know where it was going. And it went someplace that I didn't expect. And mm-hmm. I just thought it was cool writing and delivery. Thanks, mm-hmm. Stephen King. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, one of the longer scenes in the director's cut. There's mm-hmm. more to that scene than in the fa- theatrical. Okay. Sorry okay. to cut you off. I don't know what I was going to say. Well, I think part of it was um, getting back to Dan being a more of an... having more empathy and us having more empathy for Dan as a character versus Jack Torrance when he was doing those things. Jack or um, Danny has this sort of a soft, there's a softness about him and there's like an acceptance and dare I say forgiveness or there's this, he's struggled the past eight years of being sober. He's come to terms with what he went through, how he gets these terrible things from his father. So for me, it was more King's brain. Like Adela speech was just like getting his little King stuff in to, for us to sympathize or empathize with Dan. Well, there's also an element of him, like, taking responsibility, which Mm -hmm. we never see with Jack. Yeah, yeah. Right. 
Yeah. Well, Jack, because in The Shining, he was only sober for those those five months. And I mean, he was being physically and emotionally abusive to his wife and his child. Like there was way a lot of depth. Um, so, yeah, this is the chapter that has Rose teleporting, isn't it? Oh, um, I thought the so. Astral projection? Just the grocery oh, store. She doesn't go to Avril's room yet. Oh, okay. okay. That one's in, I think that's okay. in the next one. For this right, one, they're right. in the grocery store, and that's when Rose right. and Abra get to each other, yep. and then she realizes how strong. And I think this is the chapter where she goes to Crowdaddy, and she says, I want her, I need her. Right. Because she, they would live for years off of Abra, because mm-hmm. um, the, the child, this esteem of a child is less polluted than, like, the adults, because they could just, you know, kill adults and eat them. But adults fight back because they're big and strong. And little little five year olds named Violet just pick flowers and let you kill them. <laughs> I, I love the aerial shot of the caravan as it's curling around Ooh, like yeah. a snake. Mm-hmm. I thought that was great. Another director's cut edition. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that part is really cool. Yeah, I like those. I like those sweeping pans. I, I do think those. Air, there's a lot of those aerials. I again don't mind them. They're really cool. Um, they're used really effectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that one, that one over the like, where they buried the, where they killed that the baseball boy and everything. That one is particularly cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or when um, Abra, when she's, was it this one? No, I think it's in the next chapter when she finds out where the base. Yeah, it's coming up where she finds out where the baseball boy is. That's a really cool aerial because it's like fast forward of exactly what happened to him. Mm-hmm. Um, but too, I think if you think about The Shining, like I know all those, the music and the the sounds and the hums. They add such tension to The Shining. Like, it's not that adds the scary element. And so for me, I don't find the do- Doctor Sleep very scary. Mm-mm. But those, but having some of those, it took me, my heart, there's this little heartbeat that's yeah. in the sound. Mm-hmm. And it takes me back to the that, like, ominous fear of The Shining. And so for 100%. me, that's what added some scariness to it. Um and I think that's important if you're going to, for this, I think that's important, especially if he's trying to do like the the, the visual. Um, for me, it was the emotion, the emotion of, of The Shining. I have such conflicting feelings about it mm-hmm. because it is so effective to hear that music. It also feels like a huge cop out to mm-hmm. me to just be, because it, it lean, the, the, I haven't, I've been thinking about this a lot and I haven't <laughs> figured out how to like actually verbalize it. It's like there are... <laughs> This movie leans so heavily on everything that I love about The Shining that it feels like it's cheating. The music swelling up every once in a while, like you said, it immediately transports me to being seven years old and seeing the blood come out of the elevator and thinking that was the scariest thing I had ever seen in my life. But nothing else about this movie, if you take the score away, if you take the huge crossfades away, nothing about this movie is particularly scary to me. Couple of the fl- a couple of his like seeing the dead woman and child, that was that works. Some of that stuff really works, but but on the whole, I think what keeps this movie scary for me is just callbacks to The Shining mm-hmm. over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, Even if it's not the visuals, it's the feeling of what you felt when you first saw or read that material. Yeah, um, there were a lot of extra, like the hedge maze. We haven't talked about this, but like the hedge maze and the bloody elevator, those weren't in like what Mike Flanagan did, but the producers wanted more of The Shining, so he had to toss those in. And he really didn't want to put in, it's already a long movie, there's a lot, and he didn't want to have these extra things in it. Um, But when they tested it, it tested really good with fans, and Mike's like, well, I guess I'm just stuck with it, because it it was a lot of time and money to recreate, like, the blood in the elevator, Mm -hmm. because they couldn't just redo it, and it's digital, and they couldn't just redo it digitally, because in in The Shining, it's the point of view from below of a child, now they had to redo it, the height of an adult, and... It wasn't necessary. It's not in my, because Mike, Mike and Steve, my old friends, um, he's like, it's not necessary. It's not necessary. But the produce, you know, they wanted that. Yeah. So, so it makes sense. And so I th- feel like somebody, like from what you've talked about, if those couple pieces weren't in there, you, you, you know, you know what I mean? You said there was too much shining that if those weren't there, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like, I get it. <laughs> I get from a dollars and cents standpoint why <laughs> they did it because it's just, because again, remember the shining worked. It worked on a lot of people. It's hard to, because if you're, if you've read the books and seen the movies, there's a lot. It's, it's yeah. a lot. There's no, also there's no right answer. I mean, I was hesitant to like talk about this movie with everybody because it, there's just so many there's so much to discuss, you know, and we're yeah. gonna be we're gonna be talking in the hallways about this for like you bet. several more weeks. Like, so, by the way, by the way, <laughs> where I kind of landed on this was um, like 
personally, I think that this movie would have been so much stronger without any reference to The Shining. So much of it, um, I don't think it works thematically. And I think it kind of like ruins the story, particularly towards the end. But like, okay, that random guy's office looks exactly like Stuart Ullman's. Why? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That doesn't do anything for me. And it is confusing to me because... I don't see the connection. It Why feels is, like it's made by a, like a, it's, it's like fan service yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's pretty sickening. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. if it, if you get too much of it and this movie just teeters on the edge of giving you too much mm-hmm. of it. Or, it was way too much for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like red rum appearing. Like why, why would that be? Did Abra project that or what? Abra did. Cause um, she had, was seeing the baseball boy being murdered. And so she wrote the word murder on the wall. And then Dad saw it reversed. I personally love oh, that. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, personally, if you chop off the beginning and end of this movie, I think all of the true not versus Danny stuff is so much stronger without it. But that's yeah. just me. I don't like the true not stuff. And also the book, the true not, it, it's, there's way more like there's orgies and there's just way more physical stuff with They're like much the more debaucherous. and eating. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot more of that. Um, Because I guess any Stephen King book is super descriptive and you get so much information. And that's not necessary to drive this specific story, the movie version of this. That's not necessary to drive it. Um, Sorry, Christopher's looking. I'm sorry, you haven't read the book. You didn't read the book either. Also, it doesn't matter. Um, So in this one. It's okay. In this. No, I'm just just looking. That's my normal look. Christopher's like, okay. That's my face, ma'am. Simple, simple man. <laughs> Christopher, we love you. Um, so one thing I do want to so we have a really cool scene of the baseball boy being murdered, which is oh. that's brutal and amazing. That kid, I mean, this is why he's in all the movies, I guess. Phenomenal. Like yeah. I guess when they were filming, like the adults were losing it, and he's just like, okay. And he was he was like having fun because he's yeah. acting. Yeah. And yeah, kid death is a uh, man. It was brutal, though. It's a to tricky watch. thing to, mm-hmm. to, to do in a movie, and they definitely, I respect that they were like, yeah, let's make this brutal. Yeah. Um, and they mm-hmm. added so much more blood and screaming and squelching and gross mm-hmm. stuff to the director's cut version. I remember being like surprised that they showed as much as they did in the theatrical one. So seeing it this time, um, I had to go back, I had to like go and compare and see if it was. If they added more, and they did, they, they added did. a bunch of blood spatter and like, yeah, yeah. The camera really doesn't release you. It's mm-hmm. like, no. okay, ah, more, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. But plus, another thing that makes it extra brutal is you have he's the kid who's being murdered is surrounded by like you know eight to ten adults who are just like waiting for him to be dead so they can like consume his essence. And they're staring they're at just him, just waiting, and, and they're so just, excited, yeah. and you can just picture like the physicalness, and they're so, uh, it was yeah. really good, really yeah. good. Yeah, also the baseball boy's number, he's number 19, and number 19 is also a number that's in many Stephen King-related things, which I thought was awesome. Hmm, I didn't know Yeah, that. for me, though, I'm like, why is this kid walking home from the baseball game by himself? I'm like, okay, the, what is it, 1980? And then there's just that van, hey, kid. And then Andy, yeah. of course, seduces him to get into the van. I can't remember if that's what happens in the book or not. If that if that's like the like setup, why is he by himself at this alone. baseball game? He's walking home some dirt road. Yeah, no other cars or family members. Someone it's else in, is gonna. It's it's twenty nineteen. Someone, right? someone else is gonna drive. That's right. Iowa. Someone yeah. else is gonna drive that kid home. Um, Lots one, of walking in Iowa. Unless he's in a cornfield. Yeah, he, it's field of dreams. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's a this young is, Kevin Costner. Yeah. <laughs> if, if this is I. This is heaven. No, it's Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It reminded me of. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the black phone. Yes. It's a book by Joe Hill, Stephen King's son, very reminiscent of his dad's work. But um, it involves baseball. It involves, like, um, you know, kids being abducted in a van and then taken somewhere and tortured and killed. Um, But that entire movie had, like, very little blood. So watching this, I was like, hell yeah. Like, (laughs) yeah, I want to see this kid scream. (laughs) And you do. And it's a, it is a. It's a tough scream to listen to. Mm-hmm. He genuinely sounds like he's being killed, and yeah. it is fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's also, and in that sense, I love it. Yeah. Like, I love when he asks, um, are you going to hurt me? And she and says, say, yeah. yes. That, <laughs> he's like, no. That's a scary line. That's an actually scary line. Yeah. It's a good delivery, too. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and if you compare it to at the beginning, the group, the True Not, they gathered around Violet, but you never saw. You knew that they were going to kill her, but you didn't quite know what they were doing. You didn't really know what steam was, the visual of the steam coming out of the mouth and all of that. But here you actually, like, they press down on him and more comes out. And Mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, just bring on some gore. I I was there. I liked it. And that steam thing, like, so much of Stephen King's descriptions of, like, supernatural things are are done really poorly in movies and adaptations. <laughs> and like that one, I don't think you could possibly do that better because that is such a weirdly specific mm-hmm. thing. I was reading somewhere that apparently for the director's cut, they touched up the special effects there. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I don't, I haven't seen the difference between the two things, but apparently to make it look more realistic, I just used air quotes. Um, <laughs> of the steam coming out of their yeah, mouth. Yeah, the steam, but then also like the, the like, the white in their eyes, which is spooky. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah, their eyes glow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's... <laughs> some of the some of the True Not people who, like, you never even hear speak are really overselling it when they're, like, when they're breathing that shit in, for my taste. But, <laughs> a little um, too twilighty. A little too, like, <laughs> I come from a theater background. <laughs> but, um, yeah. But, it, but again, it's, it's, it's still pretty good. Plus, we get to see them all eat shit later. <laughs> well, it's also great because it raises the stakes because not long after we find out the plan for Abra is to capture her and use her steam over years. Mm-hmm. So, like, she won't even get to die. She's just going to be kept in this, like, horrific state that we mm-hmm. just watched happen to the baseball boy. Whose RV gets that mess? Anyway, sorry. I'm Rose. Just a... Well, Rose got the, has the cabinet of the canisters. Oh. be tough to sleep with a screaming child. Uh-huh. But also, because she has that conversation with Crow Daddy at some point, one of these where he's like, we've never done that before. We don't know if it's going to work. Cause she, you oh, know, right. Why buy the, why, you know, kill the cow when you can have milk and drink for years? Right. And you can have, live for one, you know, have eat meat for a month. Before we go on, I want to back up a little mm-hmm. bit. The um, adult at the baseball game who's like, uh, oh, that kid, he like, it's like he knows mm-hmm. that the th- uh, he says, oh, he hits the ball every time. Like, he can read the pitcher's mind. That actor is Danny Floyd. It's the original Danny from The Shining. <gasps> oh, really? shit. Oh, my I God. didn't know that, Allison. I love it. <laughs> Mike Flanagan reached out to him on Twitter. He sent him a DM and was like, hey, you want to be in this? <laughs> oh, my God. That's, that's funny. great. I also think that the idea is steam of steam is interesting because it's like a good parallel to Danny, who is like having his own addiction thing. But, yeah. like, Danny finds community the true not has also found community but he is more interested in helping people Mm -hmm. um like cross over at the hospital or helping abra and like becoming sort of a mentor to her where they are interested in hurting children and taking energy from other people Mm -hmm. whereas he's like really giving part of himself to the people of hospice or to abra Mm -hmm. so i think that's like an interesting um parallel there one thing i was reading um a, a recent interview I was reading with Mike Flanagan where he said something about the true not is also struggling with, or not struggling, but they, they have an addiction and their addiction is to life. Like they need that life force yeah. to, in order to sustain themselves. So and I didn't really think about that. So I thought that was a cool parallel and that ties into what you were speaking of, Allison. I thought of that too, because I feel like so much of Danny's story is like accepting death and accepting like uh, using the life that you have in the way that you want to have it, whereas the true not is terrified of that and they don't want to die. And so they've all undergone this process where they won't die, but they have to hurt other people in order to continue. Mm -hmm. I just think that's interesting. At one point, I think Rose says, you don't know what you'll, what you would do for more life or or something like that. Yeah. You know, back to the nature of the true knot, I could have gone with a couple more scenes of them being a little bit more diabolical. Mm -hmm. Yes. We get it with the kid, but when Andy the snake wakes up, it's just like, oh, we're just reading the paper. We're just hanging out. (laughs) Just having a time. I'm doing a crossword over here. You know, (laughs) it's like, what are you guys, a bunch of retirees? (laughs) Well, interesting you say that. (laughs) That's how they are in the book. In the book, they are. They're literally retirees. Because King drives from Maine to Florida all the time, and he would (laughs) see these people at the rest stops. And that's how we got the idea for the true knot. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and... The thing I was just listening where Mike Flanning, he says something about he changed them to be younger because the way they were described in the book, he thought they would be viewed as too comical in some of the, the <laughs> little funny outfits they were wearing as seniors. Good instinct. So, Yes. 
It's also funny you say that, though, because as someone who has recently watched over 20 seasons of the TV show Survivor. Um, Why? <laughs> oh, it's great. It's honestly <laughs> yeah, the yeah, best. Yeah. No, I used to watch Survivor with my grandma when I was a kid, like when it was first airing. Like I remember watching the first season of that. Tw- There's 20 seasons of there that? There are 43 seasons, Matt. Oh. It's been on since the year 2000 still making they make two seasons a year yeah and it's changed a lot it's actually fascinating i will talk your ear off about this later they are consuming steam because they are the true not what long live (laughs) last moon best for cbs (laughs) (laughs) but um so in survivor they're on an island for 40 uh days and they never have enough food and so by the end the last week because they are so weak physically most of them have to like uh, save their energy for the challenges for immunity or rewards, um, which is like part of the structure of the game. But they're physically so weak because they've been malnourished for so long that they literally will just lay on the beach all day until it's time for them to go out and do the challenge. And so I thought about that because like if they haven't been eating well for what Mm -hmm. they say is a long time, they probably don't have energy to be going out and I also thought about that because why the fuck do they add Andy? Like, why another mouth to right, feed? Right, right. But if she's fresher, oh. she might be more useful in yeah. finding more scenes. Well, she's also a pusher. She can put those thoughts into other. I thought so. I'm I thought a pusher, she had, Katie. I push people. <laughs> I thought she had a skill that they wanted. Right. That you know? there was like a, there was some line of exposition about mm-hmm. that where it's like we haven't had a, a pusher in sixty years. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Because, I mean, and with the movie, you really don't get a lot of. So I can see, Christopher, why you're hungry for a little bit more. Because having not read the book, there is a lot more history with the true knot and, like, the things that they do or what they, I don't know. I guess when they're not on the beach in their trailers having an orgy. But, yeah. But, I mean, if it get, but I guess if they get, because the, they had to sense out Andy. Like, if Rose gets those feelings where she wants to, like, seek out people who have it. And then with Andy, they could have, she was young. She was only 15. They could have just, you know, killed her and eaten her. But with her, they wanted to turn her. And there's like a, when you're turning somebody, there's a chance they might die. So, but if you turn someone, they can be a member of the knot and be helpful. So I just thought, I thought it was a skill that they'd wanted since she was a pusher and she could convince, you know, sleep. Like she basically, and she knocks Dan out. She's like, you're sleepy. And Dan falls, you know what I mean? That's a useful, mm-hmm. that's super useful. Um, yeah. The turning scenes were mm-hmm. um, incredibly like the Twilight series, which <laughs> was hard for me to really? wrap my mind around. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Like when they were cycling? And her- no, the cycling was so cool. Cycling's cool. Yeah. That shit was awesome. Again, like I said earlier, I don't know how you could make that better. Like that looked, it, I was convinced by it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the coolest parts of the movie to me when yeah. he's like uh, transitioning between decomp and... Mm-hmm. Is cool yeah, and then the, the sound of it, like, and also mm-hmm. it, it's very painful. Yeah. And you could just feel the pain they were going through. <laughs> yeah. But during that scene when she's comforting him, she's like, oh, yeah, like you were with the gladiators and you were, I want to see that. Yeah. Show me some of that. Yeah. I wish they were flashbacks almost. For the true not? Yeah. yeah. For as the, yeah, more to backstory. see where they came from. Well, if Dr. Sleep theatrical version would have been more successful, there were other projects revolving. There was going to be like a DeCaloran backstory. Um, oh, and there was like a, like like a true knot. I don't know that I want a that. thing on no, the true knot. I don't want I mean, any of I don't this. know if anybody <laughs> wants it, but there yeah. were other things, you know. Um, just call up Mike and he'll give you some information. <laughs> <laughs> just DM him. I he's think got he's stories. busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's yeah, he's too busy trying to deal with Amazon working on the Dark Tower. How the fuck is he going to do that? Anyway. I don't know. I, I don't know, friends. All right. With all so, the same uh, actors. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's how he'll do it. <clears throat> I Yeah, I can't even talk, go on about that right now. Um, all right. So are we ready to move on? Where are we at? Let's see. I'm trying to remember what else happened we just in finished, this chapter. Oh, though. it ends with Danny lying on the ground. Please help me, Tony. This was so confusing yeah. to me. Oh, okay. Some of the like mythology of this, I feel like almost retconned stuff that I thought was true about The Shining, but wasn't Tony originally Danny from the future? And if so, how the fuck does this work? Because now we're watching Danny in the future. He has no he's not doing any you know what I mean? He's not communicating with his past self. So how does that work? And then how come Tony is still a thing, even though this man is like 40 years old. Well, because if you look at Dan, Danny Torrance from Kubrick's The Shining versus Dan Torrance in Dr. Sleep, the movie adaptation that is supposed to be blending together both versions of The Shining, he's 
Tony was the, na- the name of the voice that talked in his head. That's what he tells Abra. He said, he used to call the shine tone. He says, I called it Tony. It was my imaginary friend. And then Abra says, I thought you were my imaginary friend. So to him, like this, he heard the voices in his head and he thought that it was Tony. Ah, uh, okay. That's, so for me, I didn't even think about it. I was just, if you're, that was the adaptation that they were going with, I guess. Like, um, I don't even remember the other stuff about Tony being his past, his future self. What do you say? Well, his name is Dan Daniel Anthony Torrance. And so, like, in the books, I thought that, like, it was Danny from the future, like, Obi-Wan Kenobiing his past <laughs> self. <laughs> Yeah, ex- okay, so it says near the end of Stephen King's Shining book, it's revealed that Tony is actually Danny Torrance's future adult self. Yes, yeah. so this was just like yeah. scrambling my brain. Well, that makes sense though because we have like, there's four different versions. There's four different things going on. Yeah, I guess So it's true. which version are you trying to remember or which version are you putting on the character that's in front of you now? Yeah. But it makes sense though because that's what he talks about earlier in the film. Or later, later. He hasn't met Abra yet, but later he meets Abra in a little while, and then he talks about Tony again. Yeah, and I don't remember how that God, played out in the book at all. too much shit to try to remember between the four different... <laughs> <Yeah>. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I can't imagine being, like, if you're writing this and then directing it. Oh, and, if you're the continuity you know. person on the, in the within the, like, crew, holy shit. It's like, what version are we on today? Yeah. Which one is this? Right. Um, yeah. Um, all right, so Baseball Boy's dead... Please we help me talk Tony. about Dead that. and buried loose. Oh, yeah. Woof. <laughs> All right. We're ready to go to chapter four. Yep. Chapter four, turn world. We open with Abra at school. Abra skips school and heads to Fraser and surprises Dan in Teeny Town, and they meet in real life for the first time. She calls it magic, and Dan tells her that he calls it the shine. Abra tells Dan about the death of the baseball boy and says that she wants to find him and that she needs Dan's help to do so. Dan listens, and then being the you know, responsible adult that he is, he tells Abra to go home to not shine so that the, these bad people won't find her. He said, they will find you. They will find you and they will haunt you forever. Don't, don't shine. Um, then there's a quick flashback to Danny and his mom in 1980. Uh, and then we go to Dan. He's at the hospice and Azzy the cat leads him into an empty room and he says, no, no, there's nobody in there. And he goes in there and it's Dick Halloran. Dick Halloran is there. And this is where he talks about the debt he's got to pay. And he tells Dan to help Abra. Elsewhere, Crow Daddy and Rose find out where Abra is. And that night, Rose goes to Abra's house in her mind. There's a whole long scene. And then Abra gets in her head and vice versa. And then eventually, Dan and Abra speak telepathically, and he agrees to help her. He gets Billy to help him, and they drive off, heading to Iowa to find the baseball boy's body. Abra joins them from afar in her mind while they're driving in the car. Um, Separately, the True Knot heads off to go get Abra at her house, and Rose the Hat stays behind. She has that connection with Abra, so Crow tells her to stay behind, so Rose stays back. Everyone else is off to Abra's house to get her. Um, Dan and Billy, in a really sad little scene, Dan and Billy dig up the baseball boy's body. They find the baseball glove that Barry the Trunk wore so that Abra can make that connection and find out where they are. Yeah, so that's basically Chapter 4. A lot of information, a lot of things happen. The astral projection scene is just the coolest shit ever. Very cool. Yeah. So well done. Very, very cool. So novel, but so expertly pulled off. Yeah. Uh, and the hand gore thing is just <laughs> the <laughs> fucking coolest. Lanigan loves, loves that hand gore. Stephen King, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. The most amazing. Uh, you, you said you watched Gerald's game? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There's an amazing degloving. So you bet. That's like, Isn't there one in Hush, too? At the end, in the bathtub? I don't remember. Hmm. Um, but yeah, that was really good. That was a really good gory scene. Yeah. And I love, too, how Abra, like, totally took control and just, like, and mm. Rose is not happy. She is, like, yeah, yeah. she it's, knows how strong she is. It's cool to see her not be confident and yeah. be a little scared. She um, was deflated and, like, yeah. terrified because it hadn't happened before. Yeah, it's the first time that she wasn't sensual. <laughs> 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 I think this is why maybe the movie wasn't ultimately so totally scary for me because it feels, and I'm not putting it down, it feels a little bit like a YA adventure movie, Mm -hmm. partly because it's really kind of a chase or a road trip movie Mm -hmm. as opposed to monsters Mm -hmm. coming after you. It's a road trip movie. (laughs) It's a buddy movie. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and it's because Abra is so powerful 
And we mm-hmm. see her vulnerable in a few places, but we don't often see the the hero of a horror movie so powerful and, and only vulnerable once in a while. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I also like seeing Abra so confident. Like, right. where else have we seen a little girl who, like, understands her abilities and, like, is confident in them? I feel like usually it's like they get in over their head and then some adult has to swoop in and right. save them. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think she, I think part of this, like, moving her on to why she wanted to, like, go meet Dan in real life because she can't, the, she knows the true knot has murdered this boy and she wants to stop them and that's what what dick tries to tell dan is like they will keep doing this and if somebody like you didn't step in they're going to kill that girl and they would have killed you as a kid too but dick happened to be there it's interesting it's i don't want to say happenstance but i like that interpretation christopher because i didn't thought of that but yeah she totally is totally a confident badass like even towards the end some of the scenes ever just like eh. right and she's just doing her thing because she I think once she knows how powerful she is versus Rose the Hat, it's just really cool right. yeah. to have her win. Yeah, it did um, later when they go back to the Overlook, I had a lot of questions about why, because it seemed like Abra was so much more powerful than Rose in this scene. One scene that didn't quite work for me is when they're digging up Baseball Boy mm-hmm. and the friend, uh, what's the friend's Billy. name? Billy. Billy, Billy. Mm-hmm. You know, Billy relates a story of hunting. Yeah. yeah. And then the climactic revelation is, and I never hunted again. It's like, yeah, so what? Of course. <laughs> Until about 20 minutes when you're going to be gunning down <laughs> right. about 15 different people. But In one it, of the dumbest scenes of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, it doesn't make any sense. I like that scene. I like them digging it up and right. how horrible it was. Yep. I could just smell oh, it. Yeah. But yeah, I don't yeah, know why yeah, you yeah. told the hunting story. That seemed like yeah. a throwaway. Yeah, the hunting story detracted from that scene. Just to get you to mind. the mm-hmm. smell. Right. I think that's mm-hmm. the only reason that yep. that, that, that dialogue Because we've smelled there. a dead deer, but not a dead body. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that is sort of typical Flanagan, though. Like, especially in his later work, he has this propensity for, like, monologuing oh. a lot. Like, way too much, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> and, like, an over-reliance on, like, a sentimental feel. I see. So that was, like, a thing where I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's just, like, Flanagan <laughs> going off on his own thing. But also, too, like, King does that, too. Yeah, he does. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the monologues and the sentimental <laughs> and the story. But, but also, I love it when he does it. That scene was probably yeah. 20 pages. <laughs> sure. <Yeah. laughs> also, can I just say, Billy is the best friend anyone could ever have. No shit. He's helping you <laughs> dig up a child. He's like, <laughs> I've known you for 10 seconds. Let me get you to AA. Here's an apartment. <laughs> mm-hmm. He has uh, some little little line about that in the car, like when they're pulling up, so that he's, where he's just like, if... If this kid's really there, like, that's fucking crazy or something like that. I can't remember what it is. That's a great scene. Yeah. He Mm -hmm. says, either we're not going to find this and you're totally crazy Mm -hmm. and certifiable, Mm -hmm. which I can deal with, or we're going to find the body, which is worse. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was a great line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Billy, too, is a great character because even when they're building the relationship, when he initially tries to help Dan... He, but he has a bit of that shine, and he he feels for Dan, and he knows he doesn't understand all of what's going on, but he trusts Dan. He's like, you trust me, right? We've can you help me do this thing? And he does because he trusts him. So yeah, yeah. Billy's such a good guy, though. It also reminded me again of the difference between Danny and Jack, where like uh, people always say like the opposite of addiction is like community, and that's like so true in these two characters, like. Danny is able to find a friend who helps him and a community Mm -hmm. in AA and, uh, you know, all these different people who become part of his tribe. Whereas Jack is isolated in the Overlook with no one to turn to except for all these, like, fucking ghosts. Just interesting. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts before we move on? Um, Oh, I also love, um, again, like, the difference between Danny and the True Knot, where, like, when... The grandpa is cycling. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah. They all comfort him, and they're all there for them because they are in some ways a community, but as soon as he's gone, they all turn on him, and they and consume they, him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. They're using I did, him up. I liked seeing the emotion of everybody because they call him Grandpa Flick. He's like He's been in the, this group for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it's also cool because we know that they eventually do die. And in the scene, Andy's like, wait, I thought we lived forever. And she said, no, Surprise, one, bitch. No, one promised, <laughs> no one promised you immortality. It's live... 
live, eat well, live long, and you live right. hundreds of years. So I did but, like seeing some of this, that the emotion, because there wasn't a lot of that in this in this story with the emotion that they the not felt for each other as. Yeah. Um, but here you got to see Rose being like she's all into tizzy about Abra, and then Crow's like he's like Grandpa Flick is liking. They stop everything to mm-hmm. go to, com- yeah. to comfort Grandpa Flick, and this is the first time we get to see the the cycling scenes where he's going on. It's very cool. Super cool. Very yeah. cool. I also think it's such a slap in the face to Andy where she's like, "Did I say that? Mm-hmm. Like eat? None of them are eating well. So first yeah. of all, that's a fucking lie in the first place. But like, no." I don't know. I guess it's kind of her fault for being 15 and being tricked mm-hmm. by this group. Well, but And that's part of, I think, too, with, um, like, Rose's seduction. I mean, and she's a bitch to her. Mm-hmm. She, they, she was just like, no one promised you immortality. Right. It's also and, weird, though, because aren't they in a relationship in the book? Yes. With Crow yes. Daddy? Like, all three of them? Yeah. And I think Andy is older. In the book? In the book. I think she's still younger because she still has the old, there's an older man Who's preying on young girls? Is that in the book? Too? Well, in the in right, right, because Andy's yes. she's a teenager, and so what yeah. she's doing is she's going on dates with these older men who are like after these you know young girls, and so she's punishing them. Man, yeah. if only Abra got to her first, they could have used her for good. <laughs> 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 Let's move on to the next chapter. We just um, Billy and Dan just dug up the baseball boy's glove, and so they can Abra can connect and know where the location is. So that leads right into chapter five. Chapter five is called Parlor Tricks, and it opens back with Dan and Billy in the car. After having retrieved retrieved the baseball boy's glove, they're on their way to Abra's, Abra's house with it. And at the house, once they get there, Billy and Dan and Abra explain things to Abra's dad, and he's, like, losing his mind. Um, and eventually Abra holds the baseball boy's glove in her hands, and she is able to telepathically find out where the true knot is because Barry the Shunk held it. So she finds out where they are. So Dan and Billy and Abra, in her mind, they hop in a car, and they head to the park where all of the true knot are. Everybody except for Rose. Rose stayed behind. Um, They're all there at the park, but they set a trap for the knot. And there is Abra sitting on a picnic table, and it's really not her. Um, So they they set a trap, making it appear as that Abra is there when she is really physically at home. And then there's a huge shootout, a gunfight between Dan and Billy and the true knot. Everyone dies except for Crow Daddy and Dan. Yes, Billy dies too. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So, and all right. Rose sees all of this from afar, and she is tortured watching her family get taken out. Um, back at Abra's house, Crow Daddy shows up, since Crow Daddy lived, Crow Daddy shows up at Abra's house. He kills Abra's father and kidnaps Abra, and he is driving her to Rose the Hat. A little while after they leave, Dan shows up at Abra's house and finds that Abra's gone, Dad's dead, and then he heads home to the apartment with a bottle of scotch, but he does not take a sip. He asks Tony for help, and then he speaks... To Abra telepathically, and while in Crow Daddy's car, with Dan's help, she does a little trick that causes him to crash the car, and Crow Daddy dies. Rose is now the remaining member of the True Knot. Dan gets in the car, picks up the real Abra, and now they are driving to Colorado. Dan's plan is to get to the Overlook, draw Rose there, and have the hotel destroy her. Abra's dad is so amazing <laughs> when he, like, sees... Abra's vision, like his acting is so incredible. Mm-hmm. He's like shaking. Yeah. I like how she apologizes too. She's like, I'm sorry, dad. And then immediately he's like seeing yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we see it again mm-hmm. too. <laughs> what do we see it three times? Twice. And that's one of the, right? Because that's one of the differences I think it's... between the director's cut. Because she like makes that noise in his ears when he's like about to <laughs> kill Dan. But then she takes him inside and he, she shows him then. Mm-hmm. I think it's just twice. I th- yeah, I think this scene with the dad is that was, this is a this was not in the dire- the theatrical. In the theatrical, he just sees all of it in the driveway. Right. Okay. Yeah. But then yeah. in there, you get to see him. His hands are shaking. He's having like a glass of scotch or whiskey. He mm-hmm. offers it to Dan and to Billy, and they both say no. Um, I thought that was so interesting because alcohol is such a big thing in this movie. Mm-hmm. And like when he's confronted with this horrible shit, what is his first response? Exactly. Pour a drink. I thought yeah. it was perfect. That's exactly, yeah. you know, you, you just, yeah. Well, because he's ready to think like, who is this old man, Uncle Dan? Is he molesting my daughter? Like, why are you mm-hmm. here? What the hell's going on? Right. And he finds, he confronts that guy and then he sees what his daughter really can do. And they've known forever she has like this magic in her. It's, it's different so to much experience bigger. it mm-hmm. yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a lot to take in right away. It's just yeah. like. 
My yeah. daughter, this is real, and this guy also has it. It's not just spoons on the ceiling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, my God, a child got murdered. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah, and then the poor guy dies. So, I, yeah, I loved after the gore of Baseball Boy that we just see the father's death in passing. You know, mm-hmm. we, we just see the result of that. And I thought it was a great scene. It's, it's so easy for Crow Daddy. He's just walking out the door with Abra. And mm-hmm. there in the background is poor dad, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And even when Dan eventually gets there and finds the dead body, it's like, because he's not important. He's inconsequential to the whole story. Yeah. I was really upset when he died, though. I was like weirdly very attached to him, Aww. particularly yeah. in the His glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Love well, those frames. <laughs> but Billy's death was Same. so sudden. And yeah. again, he doesn't die in the book. No. So I was. Uh, oh, he doesn't die in the book. Yeah. No. Yeah. Neither. Uh, we'll get there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because I loved his death because I was so shocked and upset. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's some changes. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I, yeah. I was really upset about that. So there was one scene, you know, uh, I have to pick a few little nits here. Mm-hmm. When Dan is able to find Abra... You know, Abra's drugged. She's in the van. She's on her way back to Rose. And there's, you know, a whole spiel about how her steam has been dampened and she can't do anything. And then Dan takes the bottle, goes back to his apartment. He throws the bottle down and then he immediately contacts Abra. Mm -hmm. I thought that was, it was just a little too, too easy. You know, a little too... uh, What's the what's the plot term? Uh, Deus ex, ex machina. machina. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, uh, oh, right. This here's the button. Mm-hmm. We're gonna press this button that I just found. It was very fast. <laughs> right. It was very fast. It like, was you knew he wasn't gonna take a drink. Me. Yeah. All yeah. of this last third of the movie is like that for me. Like too easy. I don't understand why they made some of the choices they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is about the point where I remembered why I how I felt about the theatrical version. Cause I, I remembered that I thought it was okay. But then when we got to th- this point, especially after that shootout, this is not a movie that I felt like I needed to revisit mm-hmm. because it just kind of falls apart for me. Yeah. Especially all the overlooked stuff later it really doesn't work for me. But one change I do like is um, in the book, Dan is legitimately Abra's uncle because yeah, because Jack Torrance had an affair with someone before The Shining started, and he had a kid with them, and that kid is Abra's mom. I don't need that. I don't remember I'm, that, but yeah. 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 They're, lit- they're literally mm-hmm. um, uh, related in that way. But I kind of like it better. I don't know. It works better for me, but also I think the reason why they said they did that was they didn't want it to seem like The Shining was like a hereditary thing and that anybody could have it. Uh, that's funny. Yeah, I don't need it to really be Uncle Dan. <laughs> She's also a Palpatine. <laughs> I was just going to say, it's like a stupid Star Wars thing. <laughs> it, it, it's not necessary for this for this film. It yeah. would have been a whole other... El- There's already enough to, to <laughs> yes. think about. Most you know? definitely. Because if you think about it, the focus are the three characters, Dan, Abra, and Rose. Those are three main characters. Anything involved with them are like the priority... And that would be involving like Abra's backup, but there's just too much. There's already too much history you're trying to put yeah. into the. Just another flashback with fake Jack Nicholson, but like on a date or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, they wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I, they would not have done that. Um, and for me, there's a lot of, and this is the part of the film. For me, there's a lot of like driving in cars, moving from one place to the other. It's like, okay, well, where is the. Where's the caravan now? What holds And then also the next scene when we get to the Overlook, that did not take place there originally. It took place at the campground that was on where the Overlook once stood. So there's just all these traveling yeah. changes. And then, yeah, I didn't really, really want to think about where the campground was. And, like, they're just driving in the car. Like, even when I was reading the recap, it's like it was so – you're, like, in these different cars. Dan and Billy are in a car, and then Abra and Crodetti are in a car, and then Dan jumps in Abra's body. And there's just a lot of – which I guess you have to be to get everybody to the same spot, right? Which is the end goal of it. But st- I was just there's too much going on. Road trip. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Road trip. Yeah. Who's in charge of the soundtrack? That's what I want to know. Oh. 
Um, any other thoughts on this chapter before we get to the last chapter where things will be remembered? The shootout <laughs> is totally uh, just a bad fit for mm-hmm. the movie, I think. Um, Does that happen in the book? That's why we got the dead deer story. So Dan could say, you still got those hunting rifles? <sighs> That's why we got that uh, okay. stupid scene okay. because that's how they go. I'm sorry. Yeah. They go and get the oh, rifles. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. It's just that stuck out. That felt like a, I don't know. I just don't, I just didn't like that scene. It just took me right the fuck out of the movie. It killed the stakes for me because you're yeah. telling me that these people are ultra powerful and they have these powers but and I, <laughs> two guys with two guns can take out all except for one I feel one like of if them. one of them fell down the stairs, they would fucking die now. <laughs> like it's, it's. It doesn't. It makes them way less scary. Um, it makes Rose the Hat way less scary to me too. Yes. It's just. It's yeah. And so after I watched this, I watched all of the special features things, um, which uh, <laughs> I don't know. They're very congratulatory of themselves of how good of a job they did making the overlook <laughs> happen. And they yeah they 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 have good reason to do that. But like uh, they did. But why? <laughs> yeah. And. I know that their intention was to try to satisfy some of Stephen King's quibbles with the Kubrick one, and they wanted to, they wanted to tie up some loose ends that like fans wanted. Um, but why? Well, it also kind of made me question: Why are we going to the Overlook in the first place? Because we just killed eight. 10 people with two guns, no supernatural abilities necessary. Yeah. And then we've already seen Abra kicking Rose's ass left and right. So, like, how come Abra and Dan's power together isn't enough against Rose? I don't find her that powerful or that scary. And then also, what the fuck is this plan? We're going to take her to this place I barely escaped as a child. I'm going to take this child who I'm supposed to be caring for and protecting to this place that I know is ultra, ultra dangerous. Why? What? Why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. Well, in the car on the way to the Overlook, Dan and Abra, they do acknowledge that they're power and they don't think that they can't, they say they can't defeat her by themselves. So the, why? Yeah, I don't remember. I don't know why they, they say come that. To that conclusion. Dan says, yeah, that we can't, it's, we, he, she's like, where are we going? Colorado. And she goes, what's in Colorado? And then he says something about we can't. Very dangerous for people like us. Right? Yeah, we can't defeat her by ourselves. And so he knows what he's walking. I think Dan knows he's going to go there and he's going to die. Um, but when they get there, he's like, ever stay in the car. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, P.S., your dad's dead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Oh, also, I she have a lot of her issues. Mom. She's like, uh, I'm safe. Yeah, what I'll was that? Soon. I have yeah. some, nothing else to say to her. I have some weird Sorry about Dad. issues. <laughs> My bad. House is still cool. By the way, I found your brother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, yeah he, that's his dad. Yeah, right. So they're in the car. Some of us like it. Some of us don't like it. So they're on the way to the Overlook, and their plan is to have the hotel destroy Rose the Hat because they can't do it themselves. I um, hate it. It's a pretty. Lo- it's a pretty long. Well, because they're in New Hampshire, and then she ever wakes up. She was drugged by Crow Daddy, and she really resisted those drugs. Um, I did like the scene where she's in the back of the car and, and Dan's in her body, and she's like, oh, "I feel like I'm hungover." Right. And it's How Abra. You know? Yeah. It's like this, and that's when Crow realizes that um, something's amiss. Yeah, that Dan was inside of her. Yeah. I do um, love um, Crow Daddy flying through the windshield. Mm-hmm. I thought yeah. that looked cool. And yep. I also love um, like the uh, effects when the peop- when the True Knot members are shot. Like when they're disintegrating. Oh, they all the all cycle. Yeah. I thought that looked cool. Mask yep. cycling. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the shootout was... So here's the thing, and I don't want to... I don't need to digress too hard into this, but if Rose is not the remaining member of the True Knot and these other members of the True Knot are there... There's like an impactfulness of destroying the last bit of them that they know of. They think there might be more out there, but that they don't know of. So part of it is having Rose be the sole survivor and then just having the the big scene coming at the overlook, like for like a, you know, a movie. More bang. Survivor is also what we call the winner of the TV show Survivor. (laughs) Oh, Oh, but she's not the final. So is Abra a final girl? (laughs) I didn't um, expect so much to talk about Survivor in this. Oh, man, just wait till after we finish recording. <laughs> Survivor. I think I watched half, a, half an episode once, like 15 years ago. I think my roommate yeah. was watching it, like, 
I don't know. <laughs> it's fascinating. Naked and Afraid is more my ago? speed, and it's a similar uh-huh. thing. But when you were talking about Survivor, I kept thinking you meant The Bachelor. Oh, <laughs> oh I've like, never seen wait it. Wait a minute, are they malnourished on The Bachelor? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, but that's for that's for different societal reasons. <laughs> yeah, those are the orgies in the trailers. <laughs> right, With the retirees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here is Rose. <laughs> <laughs> take yeah, take this rose. Wow, we found a way to make it work. <laughs> Any anything is possible. <laughs> um, all right, so Dan and Abbott are in the car. They're on their way to the Overlook. So we had to chapter six, which is the final chapter, which is called "What Was Forgotten," and it opens very slow. There's a sweeping pan leading up the mountain that it's mimics the one. that mimics mm-hmm. the one from when they were going to the Overlook in The Shining for the first time. I think it's literally the same footage. Um, but it's it's amazing. I, I and they use Wendy Carlos as wait, was it Wendy Carlos that did the score to the shining? Anyway, yeah, yeah they use yeah. it's all it's all there, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so and I feel like when you're watching this I will do my recap, but I feel like when you're watching this movie, you're building up to this. But also in the book, this does not happen at the Overlook. It happens on the Overlook in the book The Shining, the Overlook burned down burned down and Jack died. At the end mm-hmm. of the Shining, Jack yep. died in the burned up hotel. He burns to death instead of freezing to death. Hot and cold. And so for this, when Flanagan wanted to create, he wanted to put back the end of The Shining in for Stephen King, put back the end of The Shining, but he also wanted it to take place at the Overlook, to have to be back in the Overlook. So, but in the book, it takes place on the campground where the Overlook once was. Um, so, okay, we open up with that sweeping pan. We're back at the Overlook. Dan and Abra arrive at the boarded up hotel. Abra stays in the car and is told to wait for Rose to arrive, and then Dan heads inside the hotel to wake it up. As Dan walks through the halls, the lights start to come on. He heads around. He goes to the boiler room. He visits the room he and his parents stayed in. We see some old familiar visuals that we know from Kubrick Shining. Dan then heads to the gold room for a long scene with his father, who says he's Lloyd the bartender and has no idea what Dan's talking about. So Lloyd slash Jack talks about alcohol and how it's his medicine, a cure-all. Dan refuses a drink at the bar. Then they head to the bathroom. So uh, they head to the it's the iconic red and white bathroom where Lloyd slash Jack cleans up Dan's jacket. And Lloyd slash Jack mentions, that, mentions Abra and tells Dan to just bring her inside. Um, the management is not happy with him. So Rose finally arrives at the Overlook. She walks the halls, and eventually Rose, Abra, and Dan meet in the Colorado room. We see Jack's typewriter, and Dan is there wielding the axe, not on axe, the axe. And they telepathically send Rose the iconic hedge maze where she chases Abra, but it's just a trick, and Rose finds out. Then they're back at the hotel, and Rose and Dan have a standoff and fight with the axe on the stairs. As Rose is eating, this is... I can't even believe I'm going to say this out loud. As Rose is eating an injured Dan's steam, she gets in his mind and sees a young Danny running and Jack chasing him. We see Wendy fighting Jack on those same stairs. We see Mrs. Massey in the bathtub, the Grady sisters, and Rose sees Dan's locked boxes inside of his mind. He opens them, and the old Overlook ghosts appear and kill and consume Rose the hat. Um, in another room... Or another area, Abra's walking the halls of the hotel. She sees some of the same ghosts. She finds a possessed Dan with his one eyeball sticking out. And he's holding the axe. And he is now chasing her, just like Jack chased chased little Danny back in the day. They end up in room 237. There's so much, you guys. Where he tries... (laughs) They end up back in room 237, where he tries to kill her before she snaps him out of the possession. They have a moment. She runs. Dan heads to the boiler room and lets it rip. He sits down, prepared to die, and we see a young Danny and his mother as the boiler starts the fire and then the hotel burns to the ground. So essentially, Danny dies like his father did in the book The Shining. Um, Then we cut to the ghost of Uncle Dan in Abra's bedroom after all of this happened. He tells her that he was wrong when he told her to run and to keep her shine out of sight. He tells her to shine on Abra Stone, shine on. Then her mom visits her and then Abra walks towards the bathroom in her house and she sees Mrs. Massey in the bathtub. She walks in and closes the door. And that is the end. So much just happened. (laughs) Yep, everyone's afraid to talk right now. Well. There's just a lot. We're back at the Overlook. Yeah, yes we are. And, you know, 
I feel the same way about this as I did those newer Star Wars movies when they came out, where it's like the simple part of my brain is like, look, a thing I remember, and I like it. But it also feels like it feels like they think the audience is too dumb to just do it at the camp, like the campground. Mm-hmm. It's fan service. It's also a little bit of Stephen King service, apparently, it's according to Mike Flanagan. It's a lot of Stephen King service. Yeah, and like, and he did uh, in the interview that I watched with the two of them. It's like Stephen King did seem happy. I will say, it's extremely impressive how much it looked like the Overlook. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. It looked it looked right. I know that they had access to the blueprints. In that sense, it was cool. I did like seeing the boiler room. Because mm-hmm. um, that was such a huge part of The Shining, huge and it was part. just like vaguely mentioned in a, a little bit of dialogue in in the Kubrick Shining. Um, so that was cool. There's so many things about it. <laughs> it's a fifty fifty split for me. It's cool, and it's also cheap and easy. For me, I haven't read the book. And Doctor Sleep or that's Shining. right. Okay, uh, neither. neither. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm coming at it. A little bit with uh, innocent eyes and <laughs> innocent, <laughs> simple ass eyes. <laughs> simple, innocent Christopher. <laughs> Poor farmer boy. <laughs> but if you're going to go back to the Overlook and revisit the whole story of The Shining, it worked for me. You know, you know all of the, you know, the hole in the door. Uh, the all the scenes, the room, two thirty seven, the typewriter, you know it. I I I totally get what you're saying. It is cheap and obvious, but in a way, um, there's no other way to do it but cheap and obvious. It's <laughs> like if you're going to reference something mm-hmm. like this and make it a sequel, and the Overlook Hotel played such a huge role in it. And so much time has gone by. I think it's okay and it's kind of exciting and thrilling to go back and see all those same elements there and kind of revisit them slightly nostalgically. But again, it works for me as a movie, but not necessarily as a horror movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What part of the selling point, um, because as I said, that, Danny is dying the way his father died in the actual book, The Shining. So I think part of the selling point when Mike Flanagan is trying to sell this idea to Stephen King, who he needs to green light it before he will go on. He will he would not have done it if if King did not like it. And I think part of it is, um, okay, I want to move your ending back to the Overlook Hotel. I roll. No one wants that. But I want to do the ending of your book, The Shining, that Kubrick fucked up. So I think that's part of... I like it because I think it, I think that they could have filmed it on the campground that over where the shining went. That was still would have been eerie and creepy, and they could have made it really cool. I think you would have felt that foreboding sense of fear and dread of like, and they would have played the music, and maybe there would have been a couple of flashbacks, you know, which would have been cool. Right. It could have been done successfully. I think yep. it would have been cool. Um, but just knowing that that was part of it, and having read the shining. I, I did like that. And people I know who love The Shining, the book, they did in the movie, they're like, oh, he doesn't die. Nah, nah, nah. So I did like that they had Danny. Danny did what his father, he died the way his father did originally. And he just, and they had that moment of him and his mom. I, I like, and I'd like, because like you said, Matt, the boiler room plays such a huge part in the book, The Shining. Like, it's all about that freaking boiler. Yeah. Um, For those of you who don't know, the book ending is, um, first of all, Jack Torrance starts as a mostly sympathetic but troubled person who already has an issue with alcohol addiction and has already previously hurt his own son. He breaks Danny's arm before the book even begins. And then most of the horror of the book, The Shining, are the same elements of the real-life horror of domestic abuse. That's really like the whole crux of that uh, book. And then at the end... um, Jack is somehow somewhat able to overcome the influence of the ghosts of the Overlook. And so he makes a decision to go down to the boiler room and he sacrifices his own life so that his kid and wife can escape the Overlook and he takes the whole building down with him. But that's how he dies is trying to protect his family in one last like in his last Mm -hmm. moments. 
Um, and so that's sort of a better arc for him. Whereas in the movie, he's just a crazy asshole the whole time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it ramps up because of the influence of the Overlook. But that's who he was from the beginning. And it only gets worse from there. And there is no moment of redemption at mm-hmm. the end. He's trying to kill his son the entire time. Yeah. And he just happens to freeze to death outside. And that's what King hated that he did that too. He changed the whole character. Yeah. Because it really is a redemption arc, even though he struggles the mm-hmm. entire time. Um and so that doesn't work for me here because Danny is not the same man as Jack. And Danny has done so much work over eight years to sort of overcome this issue that he has and then also help people in a more um, uh, consistent way. And I don't think that they're really that similar as characters other than these sort mm-hmm. of shared familiar familial traits. And so it really doesn't work for me that he sacrifices himself at the end because, first of all, why are they even here? I don't understand. <laughs> Isn't that the question? <laughs> but two, like, he he isn't experiencing the same sort of arc. He's on his own journey. And so it really, um, I, I don't like that his father's ending is tacked on to the end of his life because it also gives me this really uh, strange vibe where I feel like thematically, unintentionally, Flanagan is saying, you know, you can try your whole life to escape this. And no matter what, the office where you get this job is the same office. You're going to go to Tiny Town, the same tiny uh, maze is in the overlook. These miniatures are popping up. No matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, you will never escape this. And in the end of the like, at the end of the day, you're going to go back and you're going to die the same way your dad did yeah. for nothing. Like, it doesn't complete his arc. I just, I don't get it. The other thing about this ending that I'm I'm curious how this movie will, how people's opinions of this will age. Because this came out 2019, right? Yes. So it was made right at the height, I would say, of a lot of nostalgia based movie making Mm -hmm. oh definitely um it's like it probably tested really well with audiences because audiences are a little bit stupid now and they're (laughs) and they're looking for it's the millennium falcon you know and and that's probably why it tested well and i just i feel like we'll look back on this particular era of movies and sequels and stuff like that and i hope that we we see them as icky Mm because it i don't see this standing the test of time um, as cool as it looks, it will one day look bad. Mm-hmm. Like all the Overlook stuff. As cool as it looks now, um, as we continue to improve that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's, I th- yeah, I don't, this is, again, this is just where the movie fell apart for me theat- in the theatrical version, and it fell apart for me in this one. I hadn't thought about it from that perspective before, Allison, and that makes me like it even less, <laughs> actually. The other thing that really bugged me about this is I feel like it almost retcons the, uh, ghosts of the overlook like since when do they their deepest darkest desires to vape raise the (laughs) hat like that isn't what i don't think that's what they were after in the shining like i think they wanted danny as much as they wanted jack and those are two different characters one more light one more dark i don't i don't understand how they use jack to get to danny they wanted danny and they used jack to get to danny that's Mm. how i interpreted the shining Hmm. Um, yeah, it did make me laugh where, um, you know, Rose is getting eaten or whatever. And <laughs> Danny's like, hell yeah, my plan worked. And then they all turn around. And he's like, oh, fuck, I didn't think about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then there's there are there are too many throwbacks to like seeing the 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 Grady girls multiple times mm-hmm. and then um oh and that was the that was the only bit of casting that did not work for me for the recasting things the Grady girls in The Shining are scary those mm-hmm. girls were yeah, just yeah these two cute. are not yeah. creepy yeah. yeah 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 and then um great party isn't it like that's there and mm-hmm. there's just it was I think we could have just had all of the ghosts there consuming Rose without having the other iconic and I I guess I guess Abra was seeing some of them it was just too many smushed in. And again, I was enjoying it. I liked it. I, you know, I was there for that Millennium Falcon. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I know I did the same thing. But I also understand as a person who likes the source material and likes, you know, yeah. the, the creators and it's, it's interesting. It's interesting, you know? And I think as I, I feel like each time I 
watch it or sit down for several hours to talk about something, you're going to see different things or it's not, you know what I mean? It's still something to experience. And I do like the Kubrick's The Shining will go on as like one of the top, you know, 10 horror movies. It just is going to stay. It's been around since 80. It's it's going to be there. Yeah. This will always be sort of the tack down the sequel. I do think it's freaking worth watching though. Oh yeah. I think people who, I think it's worth watching. Um, I also feel like there are right now, and this was 2019, this is right, there's a huge, like, let's, first of all, I don't know why anybody can't just create original content, make their own freaking movies. They got to adapt the, the F out of everything. And so right now we're in this giant boom of like, let's step to every Stephen King thing ever. And it's like, I was there for the It remakes like those and this. And at a certain point, I don't know. It's Ooh, just, there's one. we're in this huge saturation <laughs> of redoing Steve, or remaking Stephen King things. And it's just... It remaking everything. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's just so I feel like that's part of like the. Yeah, it's it, part of like the not the pr- it's just it's it sits a weird neatly feeling. in the middle of all of that happening too. So yeah. it's just it's like a it's a product of something that I already disagree with, mm-hmm. but I also give my money to. So mm-hmm. I don't know. It's a very fun ride. I will say that it's three hours, but it it didn't it doesn't really drag. It's definitely worth seeing. I don't know. If you if you took out the Overlook Hotel scenes, though, I think you might miss the bar conversation and the bathroom mm-hmm. conversation. And which those, are like the two best bits. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. You know, and I don't know if that was added back into the director's cut or not. But those the are, bathroom was not. The bathroom was added for the director's okay. cut. Okay, yeah. it was cut in the theatrical. Yeah. So those are those are just great scenes. Mm-hmm. They are. And that kind of honestly pissed me off because I do feel like there was a way to do it. Like, I didn't like the bathroom scene, but the bar scene, I think there is value in Danny coming face to face with his father and his father being like, no, drink, like having kids and wife, you know, it really tears you down. It really is a drain, um, which thematically links to the vampires. But um, I, I think that is interesting. You know, Danny walking around and seeing how sort of dilapidated the hotel is and seeing, you know, the hole in the door. I think that there's value in that and like reminiscing and, you know, things coming full circle. What I didn't need was a Wendy behind the door with the knife screaming. Mm-hmm. I've already seen that movie. Yeah. I don't need to see this again. I have a pretty good memory of that happening the first time. Yeah. Even if you haven't seen it, you know, those scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. Plus that added with the whole like, survivors of abuse got to go back and fix it thing yeah. really didn't work for me well part of it too i think is danny was very small when he went through all of this and it's if you think about how visually stunning the kubrick shining is danny experienced that and these are all stuck in him and he's still processing and grieving all of his father his mother and like how his father tried to kill him mm-hmm. um and I feel like it, even if it were another movie, if you had a character that was tortured by this horrible thing that happened, that movie is going to have these flashbacks. And so I feel like here, there still would have been those flashbacks, but here th- we're analyzing it more viscerally because it's like such an iconic thing. Yeah. Um, but I, it, it adds to the character. I think it adds to the character's fear and the present day suffering. Mm-hmm. Even, and sadly, be, it being a visual of the overlook from 1980 is going to be like, oh, why do they, why do we got to see this again? But like, that's what's in Danny's mind. He's walking through this place for the first time in like, what, 30, 40 years. It's ter- It's terrifying. It's terrifying. I don't know. So I didn't mind it as much. Um, but I don't know why we, we do really need the scene of her behind the door with a knife. No, no. And like, you know, he turns the corner of the hallway where the two girls are at the end. And then Abra does the same thing like five minutes later. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think that there would have been value in him um, like reprocessing those traumatic instances and like, you know, saying, oh, you know, it's just like a broke down hotel now or, you know, these ghosts aren't here or, you know, that sort of thing. I just think the extra <coughs> fan service things sort of detract mm-hmm. from what yeah. could have been a very cool ending. Because he did do a very good job. Uh, Dick Halloran taught him how to put the ghosts in the box. So they're there. Mm-hmm. He found a way to deal with them. So when he, w- if he was still seeing somebody, he just, like, even when um, Horace comes back, he's like, yeah, put them in a box. <laughs> he's really proud that he could process it in that way. But again, I, that's not a long term solution. You know, I don't know. I feel like if he, I don't know if he would have, if he wouldn't have sacrificed himself at the end of this movie or at the end of this 
I don't know if he would have just stayed clean and sober and amazing in teeny town. He can't just work in teeny town forever. Like, what is he going to do? He already has this connection to Abra. Like, how do you... not going to be teeny anymore. Is Uncle Dan coming to Christmas? Are they going to just talk like pen pals? I don't know. I just... But that's how it ends in the book. He doesn't die in the book. No. Yeah. He's alive at the end of the book. And that was the other thing that kind of weirded me out about this is like, okay, we start this movie where we have Danny who has powers, and his mother, who have both gone through this traumatic thing, and the father of their household has been killed. And Danny has Halloran. This, uh, he's not a ghost, he's a memory, who's mm-hmm. sort of his mentor. How do we end this movie? Abra and her mom, who looks fucking identical to um, Wendy, whose father figure has been murdered throughout the course of this movie, <laughs> and now she has Danny as pseudo Halloran, not a ghost, but a memory who's there to guide her. Like, again, it's like this weird cyclical thing where, like, we're right back where we started. Mm -hmm. But the only difference, I guess, is, um, like, uh, the relationship between Danny and Wendy at the beginning, like, she can't look at him, she can't talk to him about it because she's reminded of Jack, whereas at the end we do have that scene of Abra being like, we go on and Daddy's fine and... It's fine, I guess. <laughs> I thought, yeah, that was a little quick at the end with, like, Abra and the mom. I'm like, dude, your dad was just murdered in the middle of this giant, like, fight with a cult. Like, what the heck? Yeah. I I'm thought fine, that was mom. Little... Click. I'll be done for a minute. <laughs> yeah. One thing that I know that in the um, in this director's cut, they mention Abra's grandmother. Mm-hmm. In the book, Dr. Sleep, the grandma appears as a larger storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, and here, I thought it was weird that she was just referenced a couple times. Yeah. I don't know why. I feel like, I don't know why she needed to be in there, in there at all. But again, she, because the, she wasn't one of the main characters, so I don't know why they didn't just drop her completely. But yeah. it is interesting thinking about like who died in this one versus, you know. Mm-hmm. I also was reminded of the ending of The Sixth Sense, and I wanted that sort of uh, ending scene in this, where I'm not going to spoil it, but like Cole has this power. He has a greater understanding at the end of the movie about what that power is and how he can use it, and he confides in his mom and tells her, you know, this is the thing, and he proves it to her. I wanted more of that. I got really nothing from Abra's mom, and I wanted more of that mm-hmm. connection and to, like, see how the two of them were going to yeah. go forward together. Well, that's going to be the Abra story that we're not ever going to see. Which I would love because I, I would love an Abra actress story. was amazing. What's her name? Kylie Curran? I want to know more about what Abra's doing, because she's like 13 in this. Like, what happens next with Abra? Her dad's dead. Dan's dead. She feels kind of good about knowing people go on. Well, the part that worries me about that, though, is that we're right on the verge of making a superhero movie. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And now we've gone from spooky road trip goonies (laughs) to a Marvel movie. Uh Uh-huh. You know, with Abra starring as, you know, psychic pusher or, or whatever. You yeah. know. Maybe she's a magician who performs magician. at kids' birthday oh, hell party. Yeah. <laughs> I would love that. Abracadabra. But that's it. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a romp. Um, I want to go back to the bar scene just for a minute. I know earlier sure. in the conversation we talked a little bit about um, Henry Thomas playing, playing Jack Torrance mm-hmm. slash Lloyd the bartender. And I love the way it was shot the same way. And I love how we have that, that profile shot of him. And he did a little bit of the voice. He could have gone harder, which I'm glad he did not. I agree. There was just enough of that creepiness where you're getting the element and the vibe. Especially of, when he starts to get irritated. Of his horrible father. And then they're sitting at the bar. That was a really, I like the scene. I like that conversation a lot. You really, I feel like Dan learned a lot about his father and about himself in that discussion of like their struggles with like alcohol abuse and their family and how they did it, how they're handling it differently. I, I like that scene. That was a relief. Yep. That's, I think that's my favorite scene in the movie. If that's all we got of the Overlook, I'd be happy. Mm-hmm. And Henry Thomas. That blew my fucking mind that yeah. that was Elliot. Yeah. He's, um, yeah, he's in a lot of Flanagan stuff, and he's like a great adult actor in his mm-hmm. own right. I do think it's interesting that he was a child actor in, what, 1982 in E.T., and um, mm-hmm. I don't know. Original Shining comes out in 80. I just think that's interesting. Yep. You know, He was a child around the same time that the original mm-hmm. movie would have come out, and now he's in this. Makes me want to watch E.T. Mm-hmm. I want to watch The Shining. Um, I remembered what I was going to say. Um, you were talking about like the tone or like the genre of this book. Um, I understand that like uh, Stephen King had substance abuse issues in his own life, especially around the time that he wrote The Shining originally. Mm-hmm. And so this was sort of um, 
him going back now that he's been sober for a long period of time and sort of envisioning what Danny's story might look like. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is interesting. It reminds me of Lois Lowry, who's the, um, the giver. author of The Giver. Yeah, and The Giver has an ending that a lot of people think is pretty bleak. And um, she actually went back, and The Giver is part of a four-book series, but book four continues Jonah's story, which is um, interesting because a lot of people aren't sure if he's alive at the end of The Giver. Um, but the reason that she did that was because her son died in real life, and so she needed to sort of reprocess that and give that character mm-hmm. an ending after she had had a lot of time to sort of sit with that. And so I almost wish that this wasn't in the horror vein and it was more a drama or like a family. Um, it's still a tragedy, though. Not, yeah, but the events of this aren't really that tragic. Like the tragedy has already sort of happened in the past. So mm-hmm. I do think it would be, I mean, I'm not saying this is all like sunshine and rainbows or anything, mm-hmm. but I just think it would have been maybe a stronger piece if it wasn't in the horror vein. And then I think there also would be less of a um, return to the overlook if they weren't trying to sort of mm-hmm. mesh that horror feel with a story that I don't think really has anything to do with horror. It is more personal and mm-hmm. about is. everyday struggles. Yeah. Well, and I think too, and we mentioned this earlier, was it wasn't very scary. And the elements that made it scary were us remembering what watching The Shining and the scariness of that made you feel like. And so mm-hmm. that's exactly what you're saying, Allison, because if you took out the, the the overlook bits and those scary bits, you are left, you're left with a, this tragedy. You are left with this dark drama. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's related. It's interesting. How did they kill Rose in the book at the campground? I don't remember. I don't remember either. Were there more members of the Knot also there? I thought so, yeah. I read it like four years ago. I thought there were more members of the campground, or of them not also at the campground. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I mean, he kills Dan, he kills Billy. And I think part of, I think the Billy thing was just adding the extra element of like horror or shock or something. <laughs> yeah, just like a movie yeah. choice. Yeah, shine on Aberstone, shine on. And I wanted to say, stay gold. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> Shine on, you crazy diamond. We all shine on. Yeah, yeah. I didn't love that line. <laughs> it's a little cheesy. It was, a little it was har- very cheesy. Hallmark movie. <laughs> it's like, you know. I, I kept thinking this was almost a Hallmark movie. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Christopher is like, it's a buddy movie. <laughs> all kinds of kids Hallmark. die in Hallmark movies. <laughs> <laughs> that baseball boy. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Man takes a drink, the drink takes the drink, and then the drink takes the man. I like that line a lot that hmm. Jack said at the bar. We did it, you guys. We discussed this whole thing. We discussed two books and two movies right, and a television adaptation. I, I recommend. I recommend. I think it's three episodes. I think I own it's it. Three. Actually, you want to borrow it? I, I yeah. think I own it. Yeah. Um, it's it, different. It's yeah. way closer to the book because Mick Garrison and Stephen King work together. Um, there was one quote I found where Stephen King he didn't like the Kubrick one, and he and he went to McGarris. He something. He's just like fuck Kubrick. We're doing my book, <laughs> and then I can just see those two because in he were he's done a lot of other projects with um, McGarris too. He's part of part of the the King fam. Yeah. Have any of you seen Film Worker? Mm-mm. Oh, I don't even know what that is. It's fantastic. Is it a Hallmark movie? <laughs> uh. <laughs> it is all about Kubrick's right hand man. Oh. And it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, it's not called Filmmaker. It's called Film Worker. Mm. And I've just found it a streaming somewhere. Interesting. And I don't remember the guy's name. But S- he's documentary just... Documentary or...? Yeah. Did you get his name? Uh, no. Hold on one second. Leon. Leon. Vitali. That sounds cool as hell. Yeah. I think you would all enjoy it because there's... There's talk about all of Kubrick's movies, and it's really interesting. Wow. So this guy worked tirelessly for the Kubrick estate, too. Yeah. That sounds cool. Have you guys yeah. seen the documentary Room 237? Oh, fuck. I hate that movie. <laughs> you know what? I we wanted, screened it here. I wanted to see it. We did. Oh. Made me really mad. <laughs> Until A lot I of cuckoo started. bananas bullshit. Right. It's, it's, is it all like a moon landing conspiracy theory? Yeah. There's like, oh, that's not interesting. And it's, it's, yeah. It's people who don't understand the process of movie making, and they're like, oh, this shit means something. Look at this poster. Yeah. He's skiing. Yeah. It means something like a can it's, of tomato sauce, yeah. right? Yeah, 
That yeah. sounds terrible to me. It is terrible. It would. It might make you mad if you watch it. Yeah, okay. It was on but my so pe- list. Okay, so people who like the movie The Shining, they like the movie and they want to watch the documentary, yeah. but yet don't want to watch Dr. Sleep. I don't know. Um, I've also been getting, uh, now that I've been doing so much research on The Shining the last week, my phone thinks that I love The Shining. And <laughs> every news article is all about that. But there's some new book coming out, uh, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, which is all like behind the scenes of making yeah. that movie. They talked about it on with Gorley and Rust. And oh, really? And there's some stills in it that are, uh, so there is some, apparently like lost or maybe deleted footage that like goes more into um, like Jack looking through the old scrapbooks and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, there's only the only evidence that you see of it in Kubrick shining is it's just like next to the typewriter and kind of open, but it's not clear what it is. I guess there, they, there was a lot more context given to Jack that they just decided to get rid of or was lost. I can't remember exactly how that worked, but yeah. Um, any other closing thoughts? Or are we ready to do some rankings? We are ready. I think we're ready. Ready? All right. So we will rate the movie on a 10-point scale overall, whether we liked it. And then we'll also rate our on the old scarometer how scary we thought it was. So, Christopher, I'm staring at your face. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I give this Or am a... I supposed to go first? Because No, I'm not going first. <laughs> you go last. Oh. Yes. Think right. There's rules now, y'all. <laughs> so you can change your rating as we go. <laughs> I already wrote it down. So I give this movie a 7 out of 10 on the movie rating. I really liked it visually, casting, acting, story, pacing. I thought it was great. Uh, really enjoyed it. I think Mike Flanagan could have made this into a six-part series, which I would have hated. (laughs) So this made me happy that it was one story, and I got to sit down and enjoy it. I love the director's cut. I give this uh, probably a 1.5 out of 5 for the Scarometer, the five-point Scarometer. So, you know, I didn't find it so, so scary. One scene of uh, really gory brutality. And the opening with Violet was great. I just like the the whole creepiness of it. And that's uh, Becker out. (laughs) (laughs) He just ran out of the room. (laughs) Um, So I'm going to give this a 6 out of 10. Um, I I can pretty confidently say that I did not like the theatrical version um, I would have given that maybe a two or a three. Uh, but weirdly, something about this worked a lot better for me um, that I can't quite put my finger on enough that I actually kind of feel like I might want to watch it again at some point. Um, so kudos to Mike Flanagan for having strong enough feelings about a director's cut. It's a fun ride. It is a it is a junk food movie to me. Mm-hmm. But, you know, but there, I, I still have a lot of quibbles with the with the whole third act or sixth act. Um, all that said, it's, it's, it's certainly not the worst movie I've seen. And it's an, it's an admirable job doing a sequel to something that like is impossible to live up to. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you could like, it, it's it, like even just the idea of doing a sequel to the shining still offends me <laughs> and my sensibilities. Mm-hmm. But I think that Stephen King and Mike Flanagan did an admirable job. Um, even if it's not my favorite. Scare meter, uh, I'm going to say two. Um, I think that the murder of the baseball boy is very scary and very well done. And also, I remember thinking that the a couple of the ghosts were really well done. And also the, um, what is it called? When the, when De-gloving. The, the, the gloving. The gloving didn't scare me. It made me go, yeah! <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Uh, no, when the, when the, uh, when the true not people are dying, like that stuff looked really cool and was kind of scary. Anytime you put the, like the, the light in somebody's eyes like that, that looks scary, but overall, but, but the, uh, the shootout definitely, uh, takes all the, the wind out of the scary sails for me. Um, and I just, you know, what made the shining scary, a lot of those scenes that they showed us again, it really dumbed down the movie for me and, and almost I'm not going to say that it made The Shining less scary for me, but it, but it threatened to, and that makes me mad. Uh, so yeah, two out of two out of five for that. 
Um, so for this, I'm going to give the overall film rating a 5 out of 10. Um, there were parts of it that I enjoyed, enough to keep me interested, but there were a lot of things that I did not enjoy about this. I also think that I would have rated it a little higher if I didn't have the expectation of it being a horror film. Like, if someone had me watch this and build it as like a dark fantasy sort of thing, I would have been all over this. But because I had that expectation, it was like uh, a, a little bit of a barrier for me to get over. So 5 out of 10 overall. And then the scarometer, I'm going to give this a 1 out of 5. And the only reason it doesn't get a 0 is because of the um, scene with the lady and her kid when they are dead later. Um, that got under my skin. And then I also <laughs> enjoyed the death of the baseball boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, 1 out of 5. <laughs> I, I didn't labor enough how much that the lady saying like they haven't found us really scared me yeah. when I, um, when I first saw that. That mm-hmm. really freaked me out. And um, when the baby turns and you yes. can yeah. see like dead baby face, although yeah. I could have done without it going like mama. Y- yes, <laughs> like, yeah. no, you thanks. didn't need that. <laughs> Just it seeing like a dead a, baby like face a, is enough. When it said mom, it reminded me too much of like a baby doll. Yeah. 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 That was an animatronic baby, actually. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It reminded me of Chucky, and I flash back to seeing um, Baby Gage in Pet Cemetery. Oh, sure. Oh, I, love. I wanted it to have a few cheese it crumbs, though. Oh, <laughs> it's been, yeah. It's got three crackers. I never found it's the cheese. last. I think those were consumed by the bugs that were consuming their corpses. Yeah. <laughs> All Oof. right. Uh, I am going to give the movie an eight out of ten. For overall, I really enjoyed this movie. I saw it, I was geeked. I was also nervous. I was geeked to see it at the movie theater. I read the book shortly before. I wanted to have the whole King Flanagan experience. I was nervous going in, but I enjoyed the theatrical first time I saw it. I liked the the director's cut even more. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. There, it's not per, not a perfect film. Um, and I was saying that it's. For me, the movie was successful because it did not suck. If you are trying to blend <laughs> two different books, a movie version and a TV adaptation, the the writer hates this, the director did that, there's a lot to put together. And I think Flanagan did it successfully. And I was nervous to see how would, the outcome would appear. And the fact that it didn't suck and that you have this piece of art that it's going to move on. This is the sequel to The Shining, whether people like it or not, or whether they want to carry it forward into, you know, the world of film history. The book exists. Like, I I probably never would have read the book. I never, I don't think I would have read the, the doctor books. Maybe I would have now, but I don't think I would have read the book Doctor Sleep if the movie wasn't coming out and I wanted to read the book before I saw the movie on the big screen. Um, there were a lot of parts that I liked liked in it. Uh, I don't know, for me, you McGregor is not Danny. When I was first reading about it and found out he was playing Danny Torrance, I was like, what? Uh, I don't know. I just couldn't. But that's not the biggest problem with the movie. But yeah, 8 out of 10. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I've seen it at least five times. I, Yep, I'm here for it. And then for the Scarometer ranking, I'll give it a 2 out of 5. It honestly wasn't scary. I do think it was more of like a tragedy. It was dark. And the parts that were scary were my visceral memories of the many times I've watched The Shining and since there were so many throwbacks to The Shining and the visuals of being in the Overlook or the the music and the swelling and like the heartbeat that would happen in the music those things were the only thing that were that was scary but not in a scary way if that makes it you're fearful of you're afraid of the unknown Um, and then of course the gore parts were great I also love the death of the baseball boy. I'm really glad that was really brutal. I love the degloving. I did like when they were cycling. Um, But for me, it was more of a a light horror. But part of the horror is the humanity. You've got these human characters of like Dan and his mother and his father and the torture they went through. One of my favorite, um, I don't know if it was a King quote or something who wrote about it. Um, But the King said this in some format where he said something like, I don't write books about monsters under your bed i write i write about the people who have monsters under their bed so there's always this bit of humanity and i like stephen king's writing how he writes about these these human characters and they're so detailed and 
for me, it's just a huge world. So I'm really, so for me, that was the horror bit was watch going back to the overlook and remembering the fear of, you know, watching it for the first time when I was 12 or even, even now when I watch it, I'm still just like, oh man, oh man, you're just waiting because it's mm-hmm. so quiet. And, but if they took out a bunch of those overlook elements, it would have been a lot less scary. It would have just been like, yeah, there's some gore, there's some blood, it's a horror movie, you know, one out of five for horror or for scare. Um, so I'll go with two out of five. Um, and there we go. We did it, you guys. Did, did anybody it. fall asleep? <laughs> Is Azzy here? <laughs> Are we ready to leave the Overlook? I don't think you ever leave the Overlook. I think, oh, <laughs> but it's burned down now. <laughs> All right, I think it's time. I think we are going to leave the Overlook for today. If you like what you heard today and want to let us know, you can email us at whatscaresus at aadl.org. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been What Scares Us.